The Prophecy Club, a nationwide television program, a nationwide radio program. The Prophecy Club also hosts approximately 40 major city meetings per month. Our mission is to inform Christians of current events that confirm Bible prophecy. Expose the evil devices of Satan. Warn believers what is coming to America. Challenge people to stop sinning and turn to Jesus with all their heart. And to provide a platform for Christian speakers to be heard. It's a bald-faced lie. Using the positions of power and authority in our own government. The greatest oil field in the world is at the southwest end of the Dead Sea. He said, son, you must warn this nation. And now your host for the Prophecy Club, Stan Johnson. Welcome to the Prophecy Club, where we provide prophetic information to win souls and to call people to repentance. I'm very happy to be here in the studio this evening. Uh, we have an incredible talk. I believe it's going to be very well informative to not only those here tonight, but to you as well at home. Uh, now, this information, I will might as well tell you, it's not going to be a popular message, but I believe that you, by watching this tape, you want to know the truth, and that we believe as Christians the truth sets us free. So I know that some of the information you might hear tonight may be a little outside the box, but it's okay to think outside the box a little bit, so long as it leads you to Jesus and the truth. Let me tell you a little bit about your speaker. His name is Stephen Dollins. He's an ex-Satanist high priest of the Church of Satan. He's also a speaker on several Prophecy Club videos, The Occult in Your Living Room, Under the Spell of Harry Potter, of which he also authored the book by the same name. Also a, a video called Illuminati, Game or Blueprint for World Domination. Tonight, Stephen will reveal the truth and the true origins behind some of the world's most celebrated holidays. He will answer the questions, is Christmas the celebration of the birth of Jesus? How about Easter? Is it really celebrating the resurrection of Christ? And also, something I believe that we all can uh, need some information on is what is the true origin and meaning behind Halloween? So would you please help me welcome your speaker tonight, Prophet Stephen Dollins. Amen. Thank you. Welcome. Nice to see everyone here. I uh, just want to say that, uh, first of all, I, when Stan Johnson called me and, and he said, can you do another video? And I said, sure, what on? And he said, I want you to expound a little bit more on the occult holidays. And I began to argue with him and I said, well, first of all, Stan, I said, people don't really want to hear that stuff. And I said, you've already had two speakers that have come forward on the Prophecy Club tours and they've talked about the occult holidays, and they've given, you know, a, a, an expoundation on that. And I said, I said, uh, I'm really nobody. You, you get that Moses complex, you know, where Moses said, who, I'm nobody. Who, me, Lord? You know, when God tells you to do something, and you just kind of look at him, and you say, well, I'm nobody. So I said, uh, I said well, Stan, I said, uh, you know, I said, I'm kind of excited, but I'm kind of hesitant at the same time because I'm not sure that people want to hear this, this type of message. And the Lord spoke and he said, in a day such as today, he said, it's history is about to be made. And you know, you think about it, history is just about to be made. Regardless of how the presidential election comes out this year, we're either going to have our first black president or we're going to have our first woman vice president. And in a time that the future is so unknown to us, it's a time that we need to know the truth and we need to be able to stand on the truth and be able to do what God said, which was come out and be separate from among them. Talking to his people and telling his people, don't be like the Joneses. You ever heard that expression, you know, like, want to be like the Joneses? You know, and a lot of people, they find it easier just to give in to the things of the world rather than take a stand on what God says. And I see that happening more and more in, in the world today. It's, it's, people are just kind of basically giving in and doing, you know, traditions and, and doing customs. And have you ever asked yourself why we do the things that we do? See, a lot of the things I think that Christians get in problems with is we just do them because we're told that that's what you're supposed to do. Or because you grew up, and you know, if, if, if you grew up from a small child 
and you're raised in a certain way and you're taught certain things, by the time you get to an adult, you're going to continue to carry those same beliefs. And if you're taught in the ways of the Lord and you're taught things where uh, uh, God is, is good and Jesus is God's son and Jesus died on the cross for you to give you uh, uh, forgiveness for your sins, by the time you reach adulthood, that's deep in your system. That's deep in your soul, deep in your spirit. But think about the child who is not taught those things, who is taught to fear creation, a creation more than the creator. And when he grows up into adulthood, he's going to begin to fear those things because that's the way that parents control their children. You'll see some of that tonight in the presentation as how parents are using some of these holidays and some of the creatures of these holidays to control their children. Um, and, you know, people, some people look up here and they say, well, what gives this guy any, any clout? What, where do you get your authority to speak on things like this? For those of you who have not heard of me or heard me before, uh, in 1970, after my father was taken from me by a hit-and-run driver, uh, I lived a life for seven and a half years as a satanic high priest. Uh, associated with the Church of Satan, Anton Zandor LaVey's Church of Satan in San Francisco, California. My grotto, and that's what they call it in Satanism, in, in witch, Wicca or witchcraft, it's called a coven. But my grotto was in Oklahoma, and for seven and a half years, that's what I did, was lead, lead a life of Satanism and, and also as a satanic high priest. And in 1978, I came out, gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord told me at that time, he said, the path is clear for you. He said, what I want you to do is I want you to go out and tell the people what you know and what you've seen and what you've heard, what you've experienced. And, you know, I hate arguing with God because, number one, you never win. You know, he's all, and the, the, the thing is, you've got to realize he's always right, you know, but we argue with him anyway, right? And, and I argued with him and I said, well, Lord, I said, if anybody knows anything about Satan and his devices, it's the church. Uh-uh. No. And he said, if you will go, he said, I'll show you. And, you know, I mean, it, it, it got to the point where uh, uh, we went to a, a place called uh, uh, one of the churches in Soldier, Kansas, small town in, in Kansas here. And in Soldier, we gave a, I gave a talk on the occult, and I gave my testimony. And a lady came up and just afterwards, and she said, oh, I'm so glad you came and you talked to us tonight. She said, because, you know, Halloween is, is approaching. It was around October. And she said, Halloween is, is rapidly approaching, and we were going to have an alternative Halloween party for the kids downstairs. And I said, really? And I said, well, what were you going to do? And she looked at me, and she said, well, we had talked about hiring a soothsayer or a psychic to come in, and they would run a table downstairs and tell everybody their fortunes uh, reading tarot cards or we might even have a crystal ball, and she would give everybody their fortune. And I, I looked at her and I said, are you crazy? Because, I mean, but this is the mentality that the church has gotten under. Brothers and sisters, the church is in serious trouble. It is, because we've adopted practices that were never meant for God's people to adopt. Never. Uh, in, in 1 Kings, God told Solomon, good old Saul, that... He said, don't go into them, nor let them come in unto you, for if you do, surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. And what did old Saul do? Well, Saul had many strange wives. I'm sure some of us have had strange wives before. But this, when they say strange in the Bible, what it means is that they were of a different faith. They were of a different belief. And all these different women that came into old Saul's life were worshiping all these different gods. Well, what they did, the Bible says he had several thousand of these, okay? So what he did was he let his wives talk him into building a temple so that they could go and worship their gods in their own way. And so to appease all his many wives and keep peace in the house, Saul built a temple unto his wives. Now, this is not the temple that it says that Solomon built unto the Lord. This is a temple that he built unto his wives, and in those temples he put not only images or visions or, or uh, statues of their gods, but he also put their symbols in that temple. 
I want you to keep that in mind, that he also put the symbols in, the, in that temple. And from that temple, the day that that temple was built and implemented for worship, then we begin to see those, those symbols begin to filter down into Judaism. And it was adopted and it was taken of, oh, that must be uh, a glorification of the Lord. No, it is not. Those symbols don't stand for anything having to do with the Almighty Heavenly Father. They have to do with the worship of Baal or Baal, the, the ancient God. And you'll see some of those things tonight. But what I told you is that the church is in serious trouble because we, we do things without questioning. We've been conditioned and we've been desensitized by the world that if it's good and it looks good and it tastes good, we'll eat it. And it's, if it's, it's delicious, we'll eat even more of it. And isn't that how the enemy works? See, Satan puts just a little, that little sugar cube out there and then you take a little bit of it and it doesn't taste too bad and it doesn't look too bad, so therefore it must not be bad. And this is how they get things like Harry Potter into the school systems, the, the Teletubbies into the TV, uh, those sort of things. And we have to start looking at these things and start to analyze them, not take them for what we see them as, but for what's underneath it. And when we talk about the occult holidays revealed, in order for, in order for something to be revealed, something has to be concealed. And so what we want to do is we want to unconceal and reveal tonight these holidays and why they are not Christian and why God is calling the people of today to come out from among them, as he says, and be separate. So what are we talking about when we're talking about occult holidays? Well, we're clearly talking about satanic holiday celebrations. Because, see, if something is meant to be satanic and something is formed to be wor worship of the enemy, I don't want to be celebrating it in my Christian church. Amen? So we talk about satanic holiday celebrations. These are holiday celebrations that are basically formed for worship of something else other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And even though there are a lot of pagan holidays, and you'll see some of these tonight, even though there are a lot of pagan holidays that are celebrated throughout the world, there's three major holidays that we want to concentrate on tonight. There's three major holidays that are celebrated not only in America, but worldwide. And we want to look at those things, and we want to ask about the origins of these things. Now let's all agree on something. If we can say that these holidays are designed to glorify Jesus Christ, then we can say they're okay to celebrate. Amen? If we can say that these holidays actually have Jesus in them, then it's okay for us to celebrate them in the church. Amen? And we can also say that if there's nothing concealed behind it, in other words, nothing hidden behind these holidays, that they must be not quite so bad. Amen? So let's look at some of them. We're going to concentrate on the three major ones, and that's Christmas, Easter, and Halloween. You look at Halloween, you say, well, Halloween being a holiday? Absolutely. It's one of the children's most celebrated holiday. Children look forward to it all year long because it allows them to be able to dress up and, and you know, be their favorite superhero or be, you know, a ghost or a goblin and go from door to door trick-or-treating. And brothers and sisters, after you learn tonight what you're actually celebrating when you let your child do that, you will not want to let your child go out celebrating Halloween again. Now, we're going to look at Witch's Sabbath. We're going to look at what's called the Winter Solstice. We're going to look at Groundhog Day. We're going to look at a celebration of the Spring Goddess, Gathering of Sacrifices, Summer Solstice, a great Sabbath festival, and fertility rites and sacrifice. And remember that almost every pagan holiday has fertility rites and human sacrifice in them. Every one of them. And so let's look at the first one we call Yule. Now we say Christmas, but it's actually Yule in pagan and witchcraft. And it's also celebrated uh, and called Yule in the Celtic language. 
and it's referred to as the winter solstice. It has to do with the rising of the sun and how the sun positions itself in the sky. And that's from December 21st through the 23rd. The witch's Sabbath, called Samhain, is October 31st. That's what we're rapidly approaching now is, is October 31st, the witch's Sabbath. And Samhain is a celebration of death because Samhain in the Celtic religion was the Lord of the dead. And it was a celebrated time when they believed that the dead actually came back to life and walked the face of the earth. The gathering of sacrifices is called Mabon. And it's from September 20th through the 23rd. And when I'm talking about gathering of sacrifices, brothers and sisters, something like that should make your, your blood cringe. Because, and I'm going to tell you something. People that know me know that I don't sugarcoat anything. I'm not going to sensationalize anything, but I'm going to tell you what it is. I'm going to tell you what it isn't. I owe it to you to do that. You don't, you don't deserve to be told uh, you know, that something is this or that and sensationalize it when it's not really what it is. So, but I will tell you that the gathering of sacrifices is the time when you see the most child abductions in America. And some of these children that appear like on the, the milk cartons and appear on uh, post boards where they, they have, you know, a child uh, disappeared, some of these are gathering of sacrifices. And what they do is they gather them for sacrifices from that time so that they can sacrifice them on the, the night of Samhain. Ingusbad, Lugusbad is August 1st, and it's called the Great Sabbath Festival. It's a witchcraft festival. Groundhog Day, or Imbolic, is February 1st. Now, you say Groundhog Day, Groundhog Day, when the, the groundhog comes out and looks at his shadow, and if he sees his shadow, there are so many more days of winter, okay? So, this all has to do with a Celtic uh, belief in the spring goddess, and she comes out of her cave, and if she sees her shadow, then it's going to be a good harvest. And if she doesn't see her shadow and goes back in, then, then the people knew that it was not time to harvest the earth. And that's where the, the Groundhog Day came in. They took the spring goddess and decided to make it a little bit more cuter, and so they added the groundhog. And Ostara is March 20th through the 23rd. It's also a spring goddess. Beltane is May 1st. We call it May Day. And isn't it strange that May 1st was the day that the Illuminati, formed by Adam Weishet, was formed, implemented on May 1st. And it's also the day that communist countries celebrate their birthday. Summer solstice, going from the winter solstice to the summer solstice, is called Litha. And it's June 20th through the 23rd. So these are some of the festivals and some of the Sabbaths and some of the, the lesser, what we call the lesser celebrations, uh, holidays that are celebrated in paganism witchcraft. God tells us throughout the Bible, old and new, to remove ourselves from anything having to do with pagan or occult practices. Look here in 2 Corinthians 6, 14, 17. God says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what hath fellowship hath with righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? Wherefore, look at that, wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate. That's the key word. Be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Now, if this is a, a promise of a blessing, that if we do these things and God will receive us, what do you suppose God will not do if we don't do these things? He won't receive. Okay? So there's a, there's a consequence for not following what the Word of God says. We know that. One of the, the, the basic concepts that we're told now is that all gods are one God. Now, think back to 9-11 after the attack on the Twin Towers and the Pentagon. And good old President George got up and he said at, at a congressional meeting, 
he said to, to, to appease all the people because they were afraid now that people were going to go around and start bombing mosques and, and uh, you know, shooting Arabs. You know, uh, Habib down the street might have a, a Conoco down there and they might want to go down and blow that up, you know, because people were mad, angry over what happened. And we were told by good old George W. that we now must embrace all religions. Everybody remember that? We have to embrace all religions. And the problem with embracing all religions is you're embracing all different gods. So if we allow those things, remember good old, good old Saul, God told them, do not go into unto them, nor let them come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart. And the Bible says that good old Saul never repented. After, after he built that temple and after he gave in to all these different gods, Solomon did not repent, as did David his father. But there's a problem that we have with this one God or all gods, you know, all gods are one God aspect. Let's look at some of those. Well, first of all, in order for you to get a belief system into the spirit of a person, you have to make it glorify another God. Because if you're looking at all gods being one God, that means that Allah, Buddha, Confucius, all those people are Jesus. And we know that that's not what Scripture tells us. So if it glorifies another God, then it's also glorifying this belief. The second thing that it has to do is it has to take your eyes off of Jesus. Because, see, you have to get Jesus out of the way in order to bring in a different belief system. We talked about from the beginning that when you grow up, you have a belief system, and that's the belief system that you are raised with, and by the time you reach adulthood, there's not much that's going to change your mind upon that belief system because it's now instilled in your spirit, in your heart, and in your soul. So they have to take your eyes off of Jesus. Another thing that this, this belief of uh, all gods are one God does is it impersonates God. In order for you to get a belief system that Jesus is the Messiah and that God is the almighty one living God in three persons, you have to impersonate that God. So you have to replace him with something else. And you'll see in some of these celebrations that they have found a way to do that. The, the other thing that it has to do is it has to challenge your personal belief system. In other words, things that you have believed from childhood to adulthood, now you are told something totally different, and so now that challenges your personal belief system. And if you are gullible enough to where you'll eat it, and it tastes good, and you swallow it, now it becomes a part of you. And the last thing it has to do is it has to challenge the very word of God itself. In other words, something that totally erases what Scripture says, replaces it with something else. So in order for a new belief system to come in, they have to have all these things in there in order to change it. So let's look at the first celebration. We want to look a little in depth tonight on Christmas. Now, Christmas is a time, I don't know, everybody, everybody do their jingle bells and, you know, there you go. And we'll sing hymns and that sort of thing, you know, Christmas carols by the fire, chestnuts roasting, you know. But Christmas is a time where children look forward to the birth of Jesus. No, they look forward to presents. They look forward to a visit from a, a, a personage called Santa Claus, okay? Remember that we said from the very beginning, in order to get a new belief system in, you have to give something that impersonates God and something that challenges your belief system. Well, Christmas does that because, see, so many times we're told and we, we, we learn in church that Christmas is a celebration of the birth of the, the baby Messiah, Jesus, and nothing could be further from the truth. And we'll, we'll examine that tonight, and you'll see that that's, that's a lie, that that's been in, infiltrated into the church. It has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. In fact, it has everything to do with Santa, reindeer, and presents, and, you know, these things. It has a lot to do with merchandising and making big bucks, money. 
Christianity was corrupted by pagan rituals and practices during the reign of Constantine. Now, the Roman emperor Constantine was a wise man. He knew how to rule the people. And what he did was he combined Christian doctrine at that time with that of paganism. And that's exactly what the, the devil does. That's exactly what Satan's strategy is. He takes a little bit of a lie and mixes a little bit of that with the truth to the point to where it's so concealed and so hidden that unless you're really looking for it, you'd miss it. And that's what he did. He combined pagan doctrine with Christian doctrine. And the Roman Catholic Church actually believed that they could pray over and anoint satanic symbols and objects, and that would make them okay to use in worship services. They still do this. December 21st through the 22nd, we said, was called Yule. And pagans celebrated what they called the winter solstice. Now, the winter solstice, they would celebrate that by burning what was called the Yule log. And you still, still see these Yule logs in stores. Many of them are about, oh, about that long, maybe, you know, that wide. And they're, they're decorated with uh, uh, holly and evergreen, and some of them even have pine cones on them and mistletoe. And what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to celebrate that this is a time when the sun was reversed and was now rising in the sky, and they believed that this was a sign that all the sacrifices, all the human sacrifices that the Celtic people had given on Samhain, or what we call Halloween, had been accepted by the gods. And so in order to celebrate that, in order to commemorate the, the sacrifices given, what they would do would be to burn this log. And what this is, is it's a representation of the Druid priests of that time burning human sacrifices. And these logs would burn, and you still, like I say, you still see these logs, and you can go and buy them, and, and you bring them home, and we put them in our homes because they're, they're nice decorations. But they have nothing to do with Christianity. Today, we celebrate these practices in songs. Now think about some of the songs that have those, the, talking about the Yuletide. And by the way, Yuletide is when the uh, waves would roll up onto the shore and being affected by the moon during this time. And as the waves got wider on the shore, what they would do would be to put sticks uh, along the shore or posts, and then however uh, far up the tide came and covered up that particular post or stick, what that meant was what kind of a year you were going to have. So it was a form of divination. And we still sing them in things like Troll the Ancient Yuletide Carol, uh, see the blazing Yule before us, deck the halls, you know, silent night. And we talk about Yule, and we talk about Yuletide carols. And it, it amazes me that even Christian artists still sing these, these Christian carols, and they put them on their, their Christmas CDs, and, and really singing about them. And what they're doing is they're glorifying this time of divination. And in the Celtic tradition, the Yule log was decorated with holly and evergreen strands, and then it was set ablaze at sunset. So what you would do would be to take this Yule log, and you would set it on fire, and it would burn all night until sunrise the following morning. And that, again, was to commemorate whether or not you were going to have a good year or not, the way that the Yule log burned. And it was also in commemoration of human sacrifices that were done on Samhain. Now, the Roman Catholic Church believed that it had the authority to change dates and times, and what they did was they changed the celebration of the winter solstice to December 25th, and it renamed it Christ Mass, or Christmas. And in the school system today, it's amazing that in order to be politically correct, you can't mention the name Christ. In fact, you can't even go into a store, supposedly anymore, and even wish somebody a Merry Christmas because you are, have the name Christ in that particular phrase. So you have to be politically correct, and so uh, now schools have dances, instead of being a Christmas dance, it's called a solstice dance. Or it's referred to as an equinox, winter equinox. So they may have a winter equinox prom, Okay, not a Christmas prom, 
but a winter equinox prom. And again, it's all going back to the guise of witchcraft, paganism. In Latin, and I thought this was really interesting, so I looked it up. And in Latin, Christi means Christ, while Mas, M-A-S, means Mass. And in Catholicism, during a Mass, what they do, our prayers are spoken, they go out uh, to the dead saints of the church, and in this way, pagan Masses do the same thing. And so a Mass commemorates death or passing on. Therefore, if we say Christmas, what it literally means is death of Christ. So when we say Merry Christmas, what you're actually saying is Merry Death of Christ. December 25th is also a, a celebration in Roman, Catholic, in, in Roman uh, uh, history called Saturnalia. And Saturnalia, as it was called by the Romans at the time, was excessive drinking and they had all-out orgies. It was a time of revelry. It was a time just to let your, your guard down, so to speak. Undo your tie, loosen up, and whatever inhibitions you had, you just basically let them go. It was also known in Babylon as the birthday of Tammuz, who was declared to be Nimrod, and that was the evil ruler of the, the city called Babylon. And it was said that he was reincarnated as a child and born of a virgin birth. And through his mother and his wife, he, he married his mother and took her as his wife, and that was Semiramis. And so Saturnalia was also a practice of celebrating the birthday of Tammuz, who was Nimrod. Now, the exact day of the birth of Jesus cannot be verified. So we have to ask ourselves, why is this date designated as that day? Even scholars and historians cannot agree on a particular day that Jesus was born. They'll, they'll, you'll tell, you won't find it anywhere in, in, in history books. You won't find it anywhere in, in uh, uh, any kind of culture where they say that they know the exact birth date of Jesus Christ. However, we do know that it was not on December 25th. So why is this date designated as that day? Let's look at some facts. Fact, we are not told or commanded by the word of God or the Lord Jesus himself to celebrate his birth. It's not in scripture. In fact, the only thing that we are told or instructed to do is to remember his death on the cross and what he did for us in remembrance of him. And that's why we do communion, in remembrance of him. But we are not told in scripture at any point in time that we are to celebrate his birth or that his birth was really that important. Fact, Jesus' birth was not celebrated by the disciples of the early church. In fact, the first celebration of the birth of Jesus didn't occur until the fourth century. So even from the time that the, old, the, the uh, uh, New Testament churches were beginning to be established, they didn't participate and they didn't celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ the Lord. And, you know, it, it's kind of, when we look at those, that it, it's kind of um, interesting to see that Paul, being someone who was so focused on wanting the church to be the follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. It wanted to be the, you know, Jesus had said that he's coming back for the new bride, the bride that's clean. And Paul wanted a church that followed God's ways no matter what. Um, I look at Paul as probably being a prophet because, again, he didn't sugarcoat anything. He told it the way it was, and he told them what they were going to do and why they should do it. And isn't it interesting that Paul never told anyone in Galatians, Philippians, any of those churches to celebrate Jesus' birth or to put a day aside to celebrate Jesus' birth. Fact. Another fact is that Jesus was not born on December 25th. Now look at this. In Luke 2, 1, you'll find this scripture. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Now, 
December in the Middle East is the rainy season. And if you've ever been to the Middle East or, or seen pictures of the Middle East, when the rains come, the ground gets really, really treacherous. And it's impossible for someone to travel on foot or even on horse across the land in order to pay taxes. So historians believe that Caesar would not have forced his people to travel during the worst part of the year so that he could collect taxes. He wouldn't get as many as he, as he thought he was going to get. People would rebel because they were being made to do something that was absolutely extremely difficult. And so it is believed that Caesar didn't call for taxation during this time. Now, going on, Luke 2, 8 through 11, look at this. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Now, everybody looks at that scripture, and we've read that scripture over and over again, but there's something that we didn't see in it. To this day, from October to April, the sheep are confined in a corral. The shepherds would not be in the field watching over their flocks because the flock would not be in the field. Are you starting to see? And there would not be any shepherds in the field keeping over the, watch over their flocks in December. Because remember, December is what? The rainy season. I'm not going to be sitting in the field at night in the rain watching a sheep. Another fact is that Jesus' birth was established by Roman Emperor Constantine. Remember good old Constantine? He wanted to keep everybody happy. And so what he did was he declared Christianity the state, the Roman state religion, even though he wasn't Christian. And he appeased the heathens as well as the Christian church and declared December 25th, Saturnalia, to be the birth date of the Son of God. And that's how December 25th came about. It was designated by Constantine. It wasn't de designated by the rule of God or the early church, and that's why the church did not celebrate 25th December to be Jesus' birth. They knew. They knew. So in order to coincide, con coincide with the birth of the sun god, worshipped by the pagans, and that was Nimrod known as Tammuz. So you see how that all ties in. Another fact is that the Word of God warns us against observing special days or times of the year. Now in Galatians 4, 10 through 11, we read this. Ye observe days and months and times and years, and look what he says, I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. In other words, we've told you these things, and you're still doing them. I'm afraid of you. And why would he say, I'm afraid of you? Because he's afraid they're going to stray away from the truth, that they won't hold on to the truth. And John 8, 32 clearly says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, not set you free, because he's set. When you say, I set, I'm set free, it means that something happens in the moment. When you're made free, it's forever. When something's made, it's made to last. In Egypt, the son of the Egyptian queen of the heavens was called Isis. And it was said that she was born during this time, the time of the winter solstice. And in ancient Babylon, it's said that the ruthless dictator Nimrod married his mother, Semiramis, and when he died... Semiramis went and burned his body on the altar and declared that Nimrod was going to be reincarnated or reborn again in a baby. And he would come back as a child. And Nimrod had declared his mother to be the queen of heaven. In America, 
a celebration of the birth of Christ, the actual date falls nowhere near December 25th. Scholars and historians place this date near spring or early summer. Because remember, from October through April, there are no sheep in the fields. From, from that time, in ancient times, to today, that still holds true. The earlier church rulers proposed a set of nativity on that date in order to overshadow the pagan holiday. So now you start to get the nativity where it pictures Joseph and Mary, you know, looking over the Christ child being born, and there's the, the three wise men standing there. How many know that the three wise men, it took them years to get to where Jesus was born? They weren't just happened to come overnight, and they didn't, it wasn't a 20-minute ride on a camel, okay, to get there. It took them years to get there. And they did this in order to overshadow the celebration of Saturnalia and to draw the pagans away from all their practices and toward Christian principles. And what they actually did was they opened up the door now for this pagan belief to come down and filter into the Christian church, and that's where we have the practices that we have now. The traditions, the customs, the way that we celebrate Christmas all comes and stems from December 25th, and not the day that Jesus was born, but all these other revelries, celebrations. Another aspect of Christmas is the Christmas tree. Oh, this was great. This was great. I mean, you know, families, they look forward to Christmas because that's the time when you're going to go out and you're going to get the biggest, tallest, greenest tree that you can find. I mean, you want one of those things where it almost reaches to the ceiling, but when you get through putting the star on there, you know, it doesn't quite bend over and drop to the floor. But you want the biggest one and you want the best one. And you'll spend all day long decorating it, putting lights on it, putting candles on it, putting strings on it, you know, uh, even popping popcorn and putting that on there. We never, we never lasted with popcorn because I ate it before they got on the tree. <laughs> but, you know, and, and we just want that thing just to shine. And we glorify it. And remember, in order to get a belief system in, you have to take the place of something. You have to glorify something else. The Christmas tree is a form of worship. The evergreen. In paganism, the tree is looked upon as an object or symbol of worship. It's referred to as a phallic symbol in a lot of cultures because of the shape of it. Uh, in Egypt, it's called the balm tree. And look at this. Look at that word. Baal Tamar. Now, where have we heard that Baal before? The ancient god. Rome, it was with the fir tree, or called Baal Berith. You know, look at Jeremiah 10, verse 3 through 4. Look what God says. For the customs of the people are vain. He's talking about vanity. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen, with an axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers, that it move not. And brothers and sisters, isn't that exactly what we do with the Christmas tree? We adorn it. We want the best one that's available. And we want to, we want to even sometimes we even put it in the window so it'll shine to the street so people riding by will see it. And we think that that glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. I said before, the church is in serious, serious trouble. Particularly in America, people have been led to believe that this custom and practicing uh, uh, of adorning a tree actually honors God. And nothing could be further from the truth. The silver and the gold have been replaced with bright, colorful, blinking lights and shiny tinsel and ornaments. And we even put candles in the windows. And you wonder where that candle from the window came from? We'll look at it, or we'll look at it a little bit later on. But so that you know, in the Celtic religion, what they would do on the night of Samhain in order to guide the spirits in, 
Remember, the spirits have come back on that night, and what they would do would be, if they have a loved one that was wandering the earth, they wanted him to find the house, and so what they would do would be to light a candle and put it in the window of that manor or house so that the spirit could come home. And we usher in that spirit when we do these things. We're putting candles, we're putting, we're putting lights in the windows, and that's exactly where that practice came from. But see, we don't question it. We've lost, we've lost our spiritual muscle. We've lost the ability to discern things. And what God is calling his people for today, to do today, is to sharpen that discernment. Because without that discernment, we're going to be lost. We're going to be deceived like we've never been deceived before. Those things are elemental in, in the practice of Christmas. And in Satanism, these people will take the five-pointed stars and they will turn them upside down so the two points are facing up and they will put them on their house. And a lot of people, I've, I've driven by some of these houses before uh, where you would look on the house and I, and I started questioning why that star was that way. And what that is, is they're, they're symbolizing Christmas, the death of Christ. The sacred tree of the winter god, that's what you're looking at now. This is the sacred tree of the winter god. And what you see is, you see how there's no branches on there? It's all one entity. And the balls are basically part of the tree. Again, it's a phallic symbol. And the druids, the mighty men of oak, believe that the spirit of their gods resided in the tree. Now you look at that today and you sit there and you go, oh, that's, that's crazy. You know, we don't believe that. There's no belief in today that, that spirits live in the trees. Oh, really? Let me tell you a little story about a mission that uh, we went on uh, several years ago. Uh, a, a fellow prophet called me and said, I want you, we're getting a ministry team together, and we're going to go down to Texas, and we're going to go to an Indian reservation. And the, the pastor was a, an Assembly of God uh, pastor, and what was happening was he was having trouble keeping his people in the church because here the people, the Indian people, were going to church and learning about Jesus on Sunday, but then Monday through Friday they were going back to their old traditions. And so they, he was having a, a problem in keeping, the, keeping them to follow the Scripture and following the ways of the church because they were going back and embracing their old ways and their old practices. And we, we got there, and he took us for a, a little tour of the reservation. And when we first pulled in, we saw a casino. And I said, oh, you guys have got a casino. He said, no, we sh they shut that down. He said, because all the Indians, the, the, the people on the reservation were coming home drunk, and it was stealing their money. And we started driving around, and I started noticing that there were lines of trees. And there'd be like one, two, three trees. And then the next tree would have a big yellow circle around the trunk of the tree. And you'd go by and there'd be like three or four more trees and then another tree with another big yellow circle around the trunk. And I said, uh, is, it, is there something special about those trees? And he said, yes. He said, our people believe that, and they're taught from childhood, that there are little people that live in those trees. And that if you cut down one of those trees, the little people will get revenge and they will come down and harm you. And I said, really? Really? And he said, yes, he said, I have a couple in church whose son was killed. And he said, what happened was they were coming home and they'd been drinking. They were teenagers. They'd been drinking. They were coming home. They came onto the reservation and there's like winding roads going uh, all around the reservation and they're, they're dirt roads. And he said they were coming home and he was bringing his girlfriend home. And just as he turned around the corner, the car went out of control, hit a ravine. They rolled over and it said it, it put him or her in the hospital uh, severely injured, but it killed him. And the parents told the church the next Sunday that they were quitting because they had angered the little gods in the trees. So do they still believe this? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, and, and, and it just goes to show you again, if we don't have discernment, we're going we're gonna to be deceived greatly. And these ancient practices have even found their way into the very core of our government. Even our government now practices these traditions and customs 
in the White House. What you're going to see is you're going to see a 2003 Christmas tree, White House Christmas tree. And this thing is 15 feet tall. I mean, they wanted the best, right? Because if you're the President of the United States, you want the best and you want the biggest and you want the most blinkiest. What do they, what do they call it? Bling? Blingiest? And this tree was complete with special ornaments. And look what some of the ornaments on this tree were. Harry Potter. Well, sure. I mean, after all, I mean, Laura Bush is the one who said that uh, this was her favorite book, her favorite book series. And Laura Bush was the one who talked to the school systems and got it into the school system, integrated into the school system. And then your children were required to read Harry Potter in school because it was so great and because children were reading again. So you see old good old Harry, and right there on his shoulder is the owl, which is another symbol of divination called a familiar spirit, where they believe that the spirits of these gods or different, different beings would actually live inside the animal and they would direct your, your uh, business. They would be able to, you would be able to consult them because they know the future. Here's Hillary Clinton, good old Hillary, standing in front of a 13-foot tall Christmas tree, along with some Congress people. Doesn't she look pretty? And again, it's, it's all celebrating Celtic tradition. Let's look at Santa Claus. If you're going to impersonate God, you have to have the same attributes that God has. Well, let's look at good old Santa. Because he has some of those same attributes. First of all, he's omnipresent. Sure he is. That's how he gets from your house to somebody else's house clear across the world. I used to ask my mom, you know, how, did, how does he get all around the world in one night? And her only expression back was, he's magical. He's all-knowing. Remember that? He knows if you've been sleeping. He knows if you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good. Everybody, now, you be good for goodness sake. Okay, there you go. That make you feel good, right? And notice that he also rewards the good and punishes the bad. And isn't that like the judgment of God? And aren't those the same attributes as God? Omnipresent, all-knowing, all-powerful. Who really is this man we call Santa? And what do we really know about him? We have to ask those questions. Well, the Bible teaches us that Satan's primary attack is on those that are the most vulnerable. Jesus compares Satan to lightning, and in Luke 10, 19, he says, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Lightning always travels the path of least resistance. And the enemy does the same thing. He moves along that same path. And the Word of God also likens Satan to a roaring lion. 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Who, can, who he will devour? No, who he may. Which means that you have to allow him to be able to devour you. Let's look at the lion, some of the attributes of the lion. He's a predator of opportunity. He goes after the injured. He doesn't go after the leader of the pack. That would be too easy. And once the leader got hit, then all those that are behind the leader are going to run off. So he can't attack that way. He attacks from behind. He goes through the back door. And he goes after the injured. He goes after the youngest. He goes after the smallest. And he goes after the weakest. And the one with the least ability to run or to fight. And brothers and sisters, that's exactly what our children are. They are the most vulnerable. They are the weakest. They are the ones who are easily injured. And they are the youngest. The origin of Santa Claus is real interesting. I want you to see this. He began as a 4th century Catholic bishop named St. Nicholas. 
He, and, and so began the cult of St. Nicholas, and that was a powerful religious movement at that time. Now, the Christmas Almanac states that by the height of the Middle Ages, St. Nicholas was probably invoked in prayer more than any other figure except the Virgin Mary and Christ himself. So Santa's right up there with the Virgin Mary, and he's right up there with Christ himself. Legend and folklore surround this figure, and it's said that this saint performed many miracles. Some of the legend that it says is that he rescued three girls uh, destined for prostitution. He also resurrected the bodies of three uh, young boys that were killed by a sadistic innkeeper. They were, they were murdered and mutilated. And St. Nicholas also gave gifts out to the poor uh, children, and that was his veneration as patron saint of the children. Santa legend appears in the Netherlands around the 17th century. Dutch children placed their shoes by the fireplace on December 5th. For this mystic 4th century bishop, they named Sinterklaas, who magically passed from housetop to housetop and entered in through the chimneys. And this tradition was brought to America by Dutch settlers in 1626. Now listen to me carefully. All the, the holiday celebrations that we practice over here never originated in America. Never. They were brought to us by other people. And we caught on to it, and we adopted it. We changed a little bit of it so that it would taste better, and we now practice it. It was there here that the name took the anglicized form of Santa Claus or Santa Claus. Because of such controversy over whether this saint actually existed or not, Americans introduced a radical change. So now it's over in America, we don't like the way that Santa Claus looks, so we want to make him a little bit more friendly, child friendly. So here's what they did. They gave him a red uniform, they put a bald stocking cap on him, they gave him a magical sleigh. And oh yeah, by the way, did you know that when the origin of Santa Claus first originated, he wasn't riding in a sleigh, he was riding on a white horse. We took it over in America and gave him reindeer and a sleigh. And then you notice that there's the magic present bag. Well, Santa's got to have a magic present bag because there's too, just too many people to give presents to for one night. And you notice that his bag is never empty. He may, he may go down thousands of chimneys and come back up and his bag's full again. So it's a magical bag. And he has morphing powers. Well, he has to. He's a jovial big guy, okay? How's he going to get through the chimney if he doesn't ship, you know, shift his, his form? He's a shapeshifter, okay? And in 1969... Pope Paul officially decrees the Feast of St. Nicholas removed from the Roman Catholic calendar. Now, I thought it was kind of interesting because the Mother Church saw the fallacy of this and had it removed from their calendar. But the other churches didn't. And traits of Santa came from Norse mythology. Santa Claus was adopted by the country's English-speaking majority under the name Santa Claus. And his legend of a kindly old man was united with the old Nordic folk tales of a magician who punished naughty children and rewarded good children with presents. So now he's come from a jovial, good old friendly guy to a magician. The Nordic settlers that came to this land also brought with them their beliefs and gods with them. Now, what I want you to see is this. The Norse god called Thor was called the Yule God. And he was the god of the peasants and the common people. He was represented as an elderly man, jovial and friendly, of a heavy build, with long white hair and beard. And his element was fire and his color was red. Thor was also the god of thunder and lightning. And there are too many other parallel traits that are too important to ignore. Now, I, I put all this on here because I want you to see this. I think it's real interesting, and, and you'll, you'll really look and, and you'll see something in this. Thor, the Yule God, the rumble and roar of the thunder, was said to be caused by the rolling of his chariot, and he alone, among the other gods, never rode on horseback, but drove a chariot drawn by two white goats called Cracker and Nasher. 
And he was fighting the giants of ice and snow, and thus became the Yule God, or Christmas God. And he was said to live in the Northland, North Pole, where he had his palace among the icebergs. He was said to be, yield a mighty hammer, but never use it against humans. The fireplace in everyone's home was sacred to him, and he believed that he entered through the chimney into his element of fire. So Thor's element is fire. That's why one of the Christmas colors that you see the most of is red, because it represents the element of fire. Let's look at some of those traits now. He's an elderly man, jovial and friendly. He's heavy build, with a long white beard and hair. Element is fire, and his color is red. He drives a chariot drawn by two white goats called Cracker and Nasher. Sound like something else? He was the Yule God or at Christmas time. He lived in the Northland or North Pole. He was benevolent to humans, and the fireplace was a sacred place to him. And he came down through a chimney into his element, the fire. Thor is probably history's most celebrated pagan god. His influence is obvious today as it was in ancient time because the fifth day of the week is named after Thor, Thursday, or Thor's day, by the Romans. Thor's symbol was a hammer, and a hammer is also the symbolic tool of the carpenter, toy builder, Santa Claus. Thor's helpers were imps and fairy-like creatures who were also skilled craftsmen. Brothers and sisters, listen to me carefully. If you study the Celtic religion, or you study the, the Celtic culture, you'll find that fairies and, and imps, or elves, were not your little cute little creatures that ran around and, and made toys. These were mischievous, nasty little creatures. People feared them. Even in Ireland today, the legend goes about uh, uh, leprechauns and about elves, and they fear these things. They're not the cute little, you know, guy in the green top hat, you know, that, oh, no, let me go, you know, the, the, not, nothing like that. They were nothing like that. These people feared these things. They were nasty. And you notice that they are also craftsmen. This is what you're seeing here is a representation. This is a, a portrait of Santa wearing his crown of thorns. And notice also the halo. Remember we talked about the summer solstice, the winter solstice? And the winter solstice was how, how the sun positioned itself in the sky. What you're seeing around him, the halo represents the sun. And you'll notice that he has a crown on his head, and it's made of holly, berries, and mistletoe. And brothers and sisters, that is nothing more than a mockery of the crown of thorns on the head of Christ. Today we see this character in department stores and malls nationwide. Children are told that if they're good, he's going to bring them good gifts, and he knows the secrets of each and every child in the world. And that's how parents control their children even today. Now, if you're not good, Santa's not going to come see you. We've heard that. I heard it as a child. I mean, if I was doing something bad, I straightened up real quick because I didn't want to get missed. And we, we get the child to fear the creation more than the creator. They're fearing a, a, an image more than the almighty God himself. Author Francis Weiser tra traces the origin of Santa to the Germanic god Thor in her handbook called Handbook of Christian Feasts and Customs. Behind the name Santa Claus stands the pagan god Thor. In Asia Minor, Santa was a common name for Nimrod, out of Langer's Encyclopedia of World History. The fire god who came down the chimneys of the ancient pagans is the same fire god to whom infants were burned in human sacrifices. Today, Santa Claus comes from St. Nicholas, and that was conceived by Washington Irving, uh, in, in one of his books in 1809, and he started calling him Jolly St. Nick. And I thought that was kind of strange because, see, over in, in Wales and Scotland and Ireland and that, that region, Old Nick is the most common name, nickname for the devil. And Revelation 2, 6 and 15 talks about a doctrine of Nicolaitans, something that God says he detests or hates. The word Nicolaitan means follower of Nicholas. 
And the word nikos means conqueror or destroyer. Laos means people. Therefore, Nicolaitans are people who followed the conqueror and destroyer, Nimrod. Nimrod, called the hunter, is often pictured with wings holding reindeer and a fir tree. Or a Christmas tree. Old Nick is a well-known British name of the devil, and it seems probable that this name is derived from the Dutch Nikon, meaning the devil. Besides the name Satan, he's also called Beelzebub, Lucifer, and in popular or rustic speech by many familiar terms as Old Nick, taken from the Oxford English Dictionary. Santa Claus originated from a character identified as the devil or Satan. Now watch closely. The rearranging of letters called anagrams in order to hide secret names or words has long been used in the occult. In fact, one of the most infamous Satanists of all time, a man named Aleister Crowley, who wrote a book called Magic, M-A-G-I-C-K, said, let all things be concealed and let all things be done backwards so that the, the common man won't, uh, won't try to figure it out. And it began with the Jewish occult book called the Kabbalah. And the Platonists had strange notions as to the influence of anagramic virtues, particularly if anagrams involved from names or persons. So an anagram is a name with reversed lettering in it so that it hides a code name. Helena Petrova Blavansky, try to say that three times fast, was a Satanist and New Age teacher, and she writes in her book called The Secret Doctrine. In volume 3, page 78, she says, Many a mysterious sacred name conveys to the people ear no more than some ordinary and often vulgar or common word because it is concealed anagrammatically or otherwise. And now it stands proven, she's still talking, that Satan or the red fiery dragon, the lord of phosphorus and Lucifer, or light bearer is in us. It is in our mind, our tempter, our redeemer, our intelligent liberator and savior. The name isn't important, she says. It's in the letters. Lucas and Lucius are new age code words for Lucifer. Alice Bailey, one of the most uh, uh, proliferant uh, prolific uh, people who adopted the New Age movement. She was one of the founders of the New Age movement. How many know that it's not New Age at all? It's, it's actually Old Age. It's going back to witchcraft. And they just call it new. But she founded the Lucifer Publishing Company, and in 1924, she named the name, she changed it to Lucius Trust. Now, did she change the name? No. It still stands for Lucifer. Lucius stands for Lucifer. So let's look at Santa Claus. We know that Satan and Lucifer are one and the same being. And the name then comes to light. Because if you change the name around, anagrammatically, you see that Santa is actually Satan and Claus is Lucius. So it's Satan Claus. The Christmas wreath, you see these things all around. Um, this is a big church, and what you see here, down in, down in the side here, are people. That, so that's how big that church is. That's their heads right there. I, I don't know why that phoenix is there. But all around this church, there are wreaths of all shapes and sizes. And there's an interesting thing about the Christmas wreath. They're found hanging on thousands of houses in America every year. We, we put them on our doors. We put them on our, on our porches. This is a Colorado uh, couple who put up a peace sign wreath, and it was banned by the city's housing authority because it was an antichrist symbol. Now, it, it, isn't it kind of strange that a housing authority understands that this is an antichrist symbol, but when you put the Masonic symbol in anything, that's good. Again, our discernment's gone. And so what they did is they, they put this sign on there. And by the way, that's also the sign of the broken cross. When you're uh, initiated into Satanism, you're given a ceramic cross. You turn the two, the, the two points up so that the cross is now upside down. And you take those points and you break them down. 
symbolizing your break with all forms of Christianity. So that's where the broken cross comes from. If you turn it upside down so that now the, the uh, three points are up, what it means is it's the crow's foot and it's a powerful spell casting symbol in occultism. Here it is, now they put lights on it. So this was on their house. Um, I haven't heard anything further about whether or not the, you know, they put that back up again or something different. Here's a wreath. This is, a, this is one of the Christmas wreaths that you see in churches a lot. They're decorated with lights. They have pine cones on them, uh, holly, things like that. You even find them in malls. They're big, they're big and they're always well lit so that they, they glow. But the interesting thing about the wreath is that it's also, oh, this, <laughs> this was real interesting. I, I found this. This is a representation and it's supposed to be a wreath of old man Christmas. Now, I hope you can see that. But what I want you to see is that face there is clearly a demonic devil face. And there are the horns. And there's another face is down here. Demonic faces down here, and that's supposed to be a Christmas decoration found in a mall. I won't tell you what city that's in, but it's in a mall in the, here in, in the United States. Reeves are circular, and in all pagan witchcraft practices and beliefs, the circle is a fertility symbol, and it symbolizes the female womb. In uh, the occult in your living room, one of the first things I did on that video was I showed you all the occult symbols and I showed you one of the symbols was the circular snakes uh, forming a circle, the snakes coming up and then their heads forming at the top. And that was a 2,000 year old, over 2,000 year old symbol of fertility. It represents the female womb. It's also referred to as the circle of life and in the Celtic tradition it represents the wheel of the year. It's made of evergreen, holly and pine cones and it represents their gods and goddesses of Yule. That's what the wreath is. Mistletoe. Now you, you see this hanging over the doorway during a missile, you know, during the holiday season. And you know, did you ever ask yourself, why do we kiss? Because we're standing underneath poisonous and parasitic shrubbery. Amen. It's true. It's true. Mistletoe will kill a tree in a heartbeat. It's a parasite to other plants. And we have to ask ourselves, why do we put this over our best girl or our wife or, you know, whoever it is that we want to kiss from, and why is that custom celebrated on Christmas time? Well, the word mistletoe was derived from the Anglo-Saxon words mean mistle, which means dung, or poop, and ton, which means twig. And mistletoe is the Old English version of mistletoe. It's a plant thought to be named after bird droppings on a branch. You see, in the early centuries, they believed that it grew from birds, that birds would light onto a branch, poop on it, and then this thing would grow. And so when you're kissing your best girl under mistletoe, you're kissing her under poop. I told you I wasn't going to sugarcoat anything. <laughs> How did this plant become entwined with Christmas? Well, in France, the reason that mistletoe is poisonous, they said, is because it was growing on a tree that was used to make the cross on which Jesus was crucified which made it uh, 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 poisonous and parasitic, and now it, it has no place to live on and grow on the earth. The Vikings, dating back to the 8th century, believed that it has power to raise the dead. They related it to the resurrection of Baldr, the god of the summer sun. The Druids believed it would perform miracles, like from fertility to uh, healing diseases to protection from spells and curses, and they cut it off of oak trees in special ceremonies five days after the new moon following the winter solstice. So it was, a, it was a special thing to do. And what they do is they use special white cloth to catch it because they believe that if it hit the ground, it would contaminate it. And then the Druids sacrificed two white bulls while prayers were spoken, while this was all going on. And then the Druid priest would give out sprigs of this plant to the people, and now they believed that they had protection from evil spirits and storms. Mistletoe. So why do we kiss under it? Well, mistletoe was believed to be a sexual symbol because of the consistency of the color of the berry juice, red. Used by the Druids, it's an aphrodisiac. You want to turn your woman on? Give her, give her some mistletoe. It might kill her in the process. <laughs> you know. Said to be the soul of the oak from which it grows. 
It was related to fertility and associated with the Roman festival of Saturnalia. Correct etiquette is for the man to remove one berry when he kisses a woman. And when all the berries are gone, you can't kiss under that plant anymore. And a couple who kisses under it will have good luck. If you don't, you'll have bad luck. Maidens would place it underneath their pillow to dream of their future lover. And burning the plant was used to foretell a woman's marital bliss or the lack of it. It was a form of divination. So what you see is many of the customs and traditions that we celebrate in America are steeped in witchcraft and druid beliefs and practices. And we adopted it. And we let it into the church. Christmas bells. When you hear those Christmas bells, an alarm should be going off in your spirit that something's not quite right. These are, these are the sort of things that we've got to start looking at as being not quite enough good to allow into our church that we shouldn't be practicing it's even in harry potter the latest movie harry potter and the order of the phoenix takes place during the christmas holidays now why would witches and wizards celebrate a holiday if it had to do with jesus christ they wouldn't this is uh this is hogwarts wizardry of a uh, school of wizardry and witchcraft and what you're seeing here is those are Christmas trees, and they're, and they're all levitated. They are, they're floating in the air. There is a sun symbol and a crescent moon on that wall behind Harry. Here's Harry and his friends sitting here. There's all kinds of uh, satanic and witchcraft symbols on the windows, but the sun and the uh, crescent moon are also symbols of priesthood and, and priestesshood in witchcraft or Wicca. Santa's reindeer. We know that Santa's reindeer are magical. Under the 19th century, Santa flew on a white horse from housetop to housetop. And it wasn't until the poem, The Children's Friend, in 1821, that the magical white horse was transformed into reindeer. And look what Revelation 6-2 says. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given to him. And he went forth, conquering and to conquer. Children are taught that Santa is propelled through the night by eight magical reindeer who land Santa on an, in an anti-gravity sleigh, so he's in a UFO, and lands on housetops of good people all around the world. And reindeer are horned animals, and they represent the horn god Pan. They're also referred to as the stag god in the pagan religion. And in the Satanism, the number eight is the number of new beginnings. This is the symbol of brimstone, I'll show you another, another view of this. This is one of the symbols, new symbols adopted by the Church of Satan. This came after I left. And what it stands for is the double cross. Here's a, a representation of it. What you see is the cross, and you see the, the double cross here. That's clearly understood. But down here is the infinity symbol, but it also forms an eight, symbol of new beginning. And this is the symbol of brimstone. The devil plagues and torments us in the place where we're the most tender and weak. And in paradise, he fell not upon Adam, but upon Eve. The most vulnerable and least resistant, we said, are our children. And Jesus clearly warns us against harming any of our little ones. The younger years are the most spiritual truthful in one's life. As we grow older, the logical and lustful and carnal mind dominates our life. And when that happens, and we allow that to happen, it blinds our, uh, blinds our eyes to the spiritual things of God. Here's a Barna Research Group survey. This was conducted among teenagers all over the United States. And look here, under the subtitle, Displacing the Myths, the myth was that teen years are evangelistically productive. The reality is, if they're not saved by age 13, they probably never will be. Now, this is what the, the data showed. The data clearly shows that the prime evangelistic years are those before a person becomes a teenager. Satan knows that. Just in time for Christmas, this was Christmas of last year, came a movie called The Golden Compass, written by a man who was an atheist. And the official movie website was real interesting because you could go on to it and you could create your own, what they called in the movie, a personal daemon or demon. And your child could go on this website, 
punch in their characteristics and their personality, and they would have a shape-shifting demon who would be their friend from now on. If it looks sweet and delicious, what we say, we'll eat it. Here's some kids, and look, they're playing on a satanic star, not knowing what it is. You ever ask yourself, do aliens celebrate Christmas? This is interesting because this is a crop circle found in a field in Nebraska in 1999. And these are the traditional Christmas star and snowflakes. And what you're seeing at that snowflake is you're seeing a six-pointed star. And there are six-pointed stars around that snowflake or called the, the philosopher's stone. That is not the seal or symbol of David. It is the symbol of Solomon. It is the star of Baal. Remember we said that O Saul built temple, temple to his wives and to their many gods. And then if you go to a lesser prophet in the scripture called Amos, in chapter 5, verse 25 through 26, God is very displeased with the people and he says, you built unto yourselves the star of your God, Moloch, which is another name for Baal. It's one of the most powerful curse symbols in the occult. It's called the hexagram. This is the seal, the symbol of the church of Satan. The, uh, the man with the snake around him is Anton LaVey. The man to the other side of him is uh, the new pope of that church. And you see the five-pointed inverted star with a lightning bolt. Christmas has become a commercial season sponsored and kept alive by heavy retail advertising. Every time you turn on the TV during Christmas time, all you see is ways to spend your money. And people wonder why we're so depressed during Christmas time more than any other time. There's more suicide, more suicide thoughts, more depression going on than any other time or any other season is around Christmas time. And we're told and we're encouraged to keep the Christmas spirit, and yet we spend billions of dollars in merchandise every year, and it's hard to have any other spirit but broke. The very church itself has been seduced into keeping these satanic practices and traditions alive. So if you think that Christmas is about the celebration of the birth of Jesus, and if you think that it glorifies the Lord, and you think that it's okay to practice and allow into the church, then all I have to say to you is Merry Christmas. The next thing we want to look at, the next celebration we want to look at, a holiday, is what we call Easter. And what we want to examine in this is whether or not Easter is really a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, can we say as a, as a group of believers here tonight that if it's a celebration of Jesus, we want to have everything to do with it. Yeah. Amen? Amen? But if it's not, then we want to look at what it really is about and what it really conceals. And when we look at Easter, we look at a time when the church celebrates Jesus coming out of the tomb. But that name has a hidden meaning to it. And you'll see this tonight. Easter time is a time just like Christmas. When we just looked at Christmas, it's a time of getting gifts. And when they, they sent a, a lady out, and I can't remember her name right offhand, but they sent a lady out to do a poll about two years ago. And she went to the school system and she started asking school-aged children all the way up to fourth grade, from first grade to fourth grade, what does Easter mean to you? And that was the question that they asked. They just wanted to know, what does Easter mean to you? And did you know that not one of them said anything about the resurrection of Jesus Christ? In fact, the, the most prevalent uh, uh, answer to that was, it's a time for a visit from the Easter Bunny. It's a time to go Easter egg hunting. And you have to ask yourself, what do Easter eggs, chocolate rabbits and a bunny have to do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And do you know that it's exactly the same way that parents use to control their children that we talked about earlier. When they talk about Santa Claus and they say, if you're not a good boy or not a good girl, Santa Claus won't come see you. Uh, you know, the child could be in a store acting up. And one of the things that a dad or mom would look down and say, do you want Santa to miss you this year? 
And I mean, they straighten up just right away. And the same thing happens with the Easter Bunny. If they don't think they're going to get a visit from the Easter Bunny, they're, they're heartbroken. But this is another celebration that's a child celebration because the children look forward more to it more than adults do. And so Easter eggs and bunnies, chocolate bunnies, we look at those things and, and I mean, right offhand, you don't see Jesus in an egg. I'm sure you probably could if you looked hard enough. You don't see him in a chocolate bunny. So we wonder why those things have anything to do with Easter. Well, again, remember that in order to get a belief system integrated into your system, into your belief system, that all gods are one God, you have to impersonate God and you have to replace him. And that's exactly what the Easter bunny and eggs have done. Where did Easter get its name? Those are some of the things we have to look at is where did Easter get its name? Where did the concept of the Easter bunny and the Easter egg actually originate? And do these things have any relation to the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Because if we can say no to any of these things, then we can rule this celebration out as being Christian or as being something that needs to be celebrated in the church. In Scripture, the word Easter is found in the book of Acts 12.4. Now look what it says. Now about that time, Herod the king, and look what he said, that time, talking about a special, particular time. That about that time, Herod the king, and who was Herod? Herod was the king who wanted to destroy Jesus and sent men out to find infants and just starting to destroy infants, hoping that one of the infants that were destroyed, Jewish infants that were destroyed, would be the Messiah, the Christ child. Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. That means cause them a whole lot of hurt. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. Now notice that he saw it pleased the Jews. So he saw that it pleased the Jews that there was a killing that James, the brother of John, was killed with the sword. And he proceeded to take Peter also, on and about that time. Now what time is he talking about? Well, look here. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison, talking about Peter now, and delivered him to four quarter minions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Now, let me ask you a question. Put on your thinking caps for just a second. If Easter has to do with the resurrection, why is Herod the king celebrating it? Why does he put it as being any kind of importance? Remember, he wanted Christ destroyed before he had a chance to grow to adulthood. So if Easter has to do with the resurrection, why would Herod be celebrating Easter? Duh. <laughs> the Greek word Pasha is translated Easter in Acts 12.4. And that word Pasha is used several other times in Scripture. So it's absurd to think that this refers to the resurrection of Jesus because, number one, this event, the resurrection event, hadn't been given a name yet. It wasn't called Easter. And, the, and you know where in Scripture do you see the, the church... The, the, the New Testament church that Paul established, you don't see them celebrating Easter. No other place. You can't find it. You can't show it to me. It's not there. So it's absurd to think that this is about the resurrection of Jesus because, number one, this didn't have a name or a title to it, and it wasn't being celebrated as a holiday at this time. But it appears 29 times in the New Testament. 28 of those... The word is rendered Passover, and it's in reference to the night when the Lord passed over Egypt and, and killed all the firstborn of the, of the land uh, as an act to force the Pharaoh to let the Jews go. We all know the story of Moses, and let them go and, and setting Israel free from 400 years of, of slavery and bondage. Now, for too many years, Christianity has misunderstood that word, 
Easter. Okay? Because they believe that it refers to the resurrection of the Christ as an event. The fact is, the word Easter has its origin, origin in paganism. Easter, as we know it, comes from the form of the ancient festival of Astarte, also called Ishtar, or Estre, the Teutonic goddess of spring. Historical scholars have always known and agreed on this fact. In other words, this is not something we're just making up. Historians have known this, and they've agreed on it for several years, hundreds of years. Then this festival was held in the month of April, this one that we're calling Astarte. And a celebration of Mother Earth regenerating herself after the winter season, or the winter solstice. And this also a celebration of fertility and reproduction. Hmm, could that be where the bunny comes from? Because the bunny procreates real rapidly. Now at the center of Astarte is a female deity. See, there's always a woman at the, at the base of things, see? Who was born from a great egg. And in Jeremiah 17, 18 and 44, 17 through 25, she's referred to as the queen of heaven. Where did we see this before? Nimrod's mother, his wife, referred to, Semiramis, referred to as the queen of heaven. See, Mary is nowhere ever, 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 ever referred to as the queen of heaven. Never. In Ezekiel 8, 13 through 16, she's the mother of Tammuz, remember, who was also her husband, and that was also Nimrod, reincarnated as a baby child. And in the Babylonian kingdom, there Nimrod the king and his mother, the queen Semiramis, who Nimrod took as his wife. And when Nimrod died, remember, Samarius told the Babylonian people that he ascended into the underworld and that he would be resurrected, and when he came back, he would come back as a deity. In other words, when he came back, he would be known as a god. And this incestuous, adulterous woman later gave birth to an illegitimate son, and she named him Tammuz. And she claimed that this was Nimrod, her husband, who had died and been reborn. And he was also called the god of the sun and the father of creation. Semiramis became the goddess of the moon and fertility. So those were the two things that she was known for. And after the death of Semiramis, she was identified as Ishtar, pronounced in America as Easter. And names in other lands, she was called the wife of Baal. She was called Ashtoreth, or Astaroth, Astarte, Ostera, and Estre. Semiramis created a mystery religion, and she taught that the moon was a goddess that went through a 28-day cycle and ovulated when full. Oh, yeah. You know, we have that, that movement now, the, the weirdos call the, the Gaia movement. You know, the Mother Gaia, you know, she's a, she, she feels, and it's a, Earth is a living being, and she feels, and she gets teed off when you do things, and that's why we have earthquakes and tidal waves and all that stuff as she's retaliating. You know, she's probably going through menopause. I don't know. <laughs> but she th also, they taught that the moon was also a living being. So the moon and the sun were actually living beings, a god. And she claimed that she was immaculately conceived. Now, she also claimed that she came down from the moon in a great moon egg that fell into the Euphrates River. And her moon egg became known as Ishtar's egg, or as we call it, the Easter egg. This is the egg of Ishtar. And I wish you could see that clearer. That was the only picture of it I could find. There's the crescent moon at the top. This is gold down here. And in that gold, you'll find hundreds of representations of six-pointed stars in that, in that base. So that's the egg of Ishtar, or, or representation of what the moon egg, the Easter egg, actually looked like. Now what you're seeing here is a UN flag 
Uh, they had one of those celebrations of uh, uh, Mother Earth, uh, peace all over the world type of celebrations. And this was the flag that they used. And what you're seeing here, if you look closely at the top of that circle, there's the, the mother goddess figure looking down on the people. And you see the people here in a circle. And in that circle is a form of energy. So what's happening is she's energizing the people through this particular form of energy as they're holding hands and joining together in a circle. And again, that all goes back to witchcraft or Wicca celebrations. And this was, this was a, a, a peace day, a world, world peace day uh, celebration, and this was the flag that was, that was used. Tammuz, as a young boy, was noted to be especially fond of rabbits, and so his mother made the rabbit a sacred symbol. And she told the worshipers that when Tammuz was killed, the, the, the story was that he was killed by a wild pig, a boar, and some of his blood fell on the stump of an evergreen. Now watch this. The blood fell on the stump of an evergreen, which grew into a full tree overnight, and the evergreen became a sacred symbol because it had been covered with the blood of Tammuz. The Christmas tree, the evergreen. And now you wonder why all this green movement? You start to see how things begin to coincide with, with things. And this is also, remember we talked about the two colors of Christmas? were red and green. Red, the color of fire. Green, the color of Mother Earth, Mother Gaia. A celebration was held on the first Sunday of each spring every year and the first full moon after the spring equinox. And the Babylonians also were instructed to make and bake what was called hot cross buns. Yum, yum. And what they would do would be to form the first letter of Tammuz's name on the bun itself. And so they would take their index finger and their middle finger, and they would, in the dough, they would make the form of a T, as in commemoration, in memory of Tammuz's first name, letter of his name, the T. And that symbol on the bun formed with the index and middle finger was in memory and honor of his name, and we see that the celebration also included rabbits and eggs. And the idea of a mystic egg spread from Babylon all to other parts of the world. And in Rome, the mystic egg preceded processions in honor of the Roman mother goddess called Diana. And Diana, by the way, is also the Wiccan goddess, the most uh, uh, prevalent goddess that the Wiccans look at because she's a female goddess and she is the goddess of the moon. Even today, it still holds as a symbol of spiritual power and authority. Here you see the Pope, and look at his hat. Note the distinct shape of the egg on that cap. It's not round. It's not cut off. It's not a top hat. It clearly is an egg symbol. And if you were able to look onto his hat, you would see ancient symbols on that hat. You'll find crescent moons. You'll find five-pointed stars. You'll find other symbols on top of that, that hat, on that crown. And look what he's doing. He's holding up the index finger and the middle finger. And the T's at that time were formed as a, as a cross. In other words, a T wasn't like a T like we see it. It would be a line down and then a line almost in the middle of that line down. And that's clearly what he's wearing here because you see the line going up and then across it's wider. And that is the form of the Babylonian T. And this is a painting. This is actually a wood painting uh, found in a church. And you'll see that this is not Mary and the Christ child. And how do we know that? Well, if you'll look here, you'll see that she has a halo behind her. Remember that Semiramis is the goddess of the moon. Okay? And you'll see that 
the child she's holding is being given a wafer, but the wafer is egg-shaped. You'll also see that she's wearing red, and the child is wearing the two colors, green and red. And he also has a halo, or representation of the moon with symbols on it, around his head. And he's pulling the cloak, trying to conceal something, trying to cover it. And you'll also notice that the child is also wearing gold chains. Clearly that is not the Christ child. Because Jesus would not even be seen wearing bling. Seen wearing bling. Ah, God. Thank you, Lord, for that revelation. All right. And she also declared that Tammuz, her son, was of a virgin birth. This is another wood painting. And this is pretty interesting. Up here is a, um, you'll see is a, uh, one of the disciples down here is a, a woman holding an infant, and over here is uh, supposed to be a representation of Jesus. And you'll see the halo around her, but what I want you to see is that her hands are stretched out like this. And what she is doing is she's holding up the moon, that halo. And underneath her, actually inside of her, is the child and you'll see that the child here also has the halo around him again, and he is also holding up the index finger and middle finger, forming the T. And what do the, the mother church priests do when they bless people? Are they making the sign of the cross? No, they are making the sign of the T. But again, they've been told something, they believe it. So clearly, that is not representation of Mary and the Christ child. Uh, he is forming the sign of the T, the sign of Tammuz. Every year, schools and churches around the world, big or small, sponsor what they call Easter egg hunts. Now, what you're seeing here is a picture of a church Easter egg hunt. And I'm, I'm telling you, I'd rather walk around town dressed like Santa Claus than the Easter Bunny. Okay? But... Here's a guy, you know, genuinely dressed as the Easter Bunny, pointing the way to the Easter egg hunt at 12 noon. And they promise goodies and prizes to children who are ready to look high and low for that special egg, that special colored egg that they have. Here's the ladies, they're getting the Easter eggs ready, and you see that it's, a, it's filled full of uh, candies and, and colorful eggs. And children are taught to actually look forward to Easter egg hunting and getting a visit from the Easter bunny or the rabbit. And they're promised candy and prizes and toys. And notice that they're, again, only for good boys and good girls receive them. Not the bad. The bad gets an, East, uh, uh, an uh, empty basket. Children go scurrying to collect as many eggs as they can in order to win prizes and get the most eggs before anyone else can. And you know what? I've seen kids at Easter egg hunts push each other out of the way, almost get in fights because they're looking for that one special egg. It's kind of like the, the times that the Pokemon cards came out and our kids were fighting each other and hurting each other and even stabbing each other on the school grounds trying to get that card, those special cards. Like Santa Claus, the Easter rabbit is respected and revered by young adults. And he brings Easter baskets with, with candy and eggs, much the same way that Santa fills stockings. Now, everybody go, oh, because see, he's cute. And you see the girl over here, she's pointing, you know. The mother's sitting there, she's real happy. The child's happy, you're all content. This one's not. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, this is clearly a doctored picture. You see the guy in the, you'll, you'll see he's in a Santa suit. And they, and they put a, a face, this face over, over him. So, but you see, the, but it preaches. Because, see, we've actually taught the kids to fear these things. Not because, you know, they're, they're terrible or demonic, but because they won't bring them what their heart's desire is, which is goodies. It's all about getting something. It even makes a mockery of the real reason for the resurrection of Jesus and his coming out of the tomb. Now, this is a, a cartoon 
that appeared in a magazine. And what you see is Mary is sitting down here by the tomb, and she's got the Easter basket by her, and Jesus comes out carrying an Easter basket, and he says, Oh, quit whining, Mary. You won the Easter egg hunt last year. Here's another one. It's called The Last Breakfast. You see Jesus has been dining on Easter eggs and chocolate bunnies. And he says, man, I freaking love Easter. This is going to be a good day. I can just feel it. This is my favorite. Take a minute to look at this. What's that? I have no idea. But you know what? That's exactly what's happened. That's exactly what's happened. The Easter bunny and the egg have overshadowed the cross. We have allowed it to happen. Parents, in your homes, you've allowed it to happen. And this is why we are in serious trouble. It's when we start to look at these things and see that there's no, no problem in them. And the more we see no problem in them, the bigger it's going to get. The celebration of this Easter festival has nothing to do with Christianity, but rather the celebration of, ag- of ancient pagan deities. Now, in our church, we have what's called Resurrection Sunday. And in Resurrection Sunday, we'll have like a, a, a play having to do with the, uh, the resurrection of Jesus, his, his death on the cross and his going into the tomb and being resurrected. And I know a lot of churches now have gotten away from the Easter egg hunts and the, the, the um, you know, visit from the Easter bunny. Did you know that there's been churches that have actually had Easter bunnies visit the Sunday school class? <clears throat> they've, even had, they've even had where the... The, the Sunday school teacher would tell the children and, and she would sit there and she would say, now if you're all quiet and you're all good, good, the Easter egg bunny might come in. And that's the cue and then the Easter egg bunny comes hopping in, okay, and gives baskets. And so what the parents would do would be to receive their children after Sunday school and rather than having a Bible verse learned or something else, they would present them with an Easter basket. And we call that okay, and we call that as being a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus, and it's nothing more and further from the truth. The church is in serious trouble when it incorporates resurrection eggs, because see, now we have to be politically correct. Remember, we can't say Merry Christmas anymore? Well, almost now you can't say Easter celebration, because the world looks at it as Easter being associated with Christ. So if you can't say Merry Christmas, you can't say have a happy Easter either. Because they don't want you to be happy. Okay? So they've, they've incorporated what's called resurrection eggs as part of their Easter celebration. And it's nothing more than combining Christianity with witchcraft. Light with darkness. And didn't we read before that in Scripture that's what God says don't do come away from it. The bunny is a creature that procreates quickly, and it symbolizes the sexual act. The egg symbolizes birth and renewal. Remember, it all goes back to the Ishtar egg. And together, the Easter bunny and Easter egg are symbols of the sex act and its offspring of Semiramis and Tammuz. During the second century AD, the Catholic Church found a need to set a formal holiday celebrating resurrection of Jesus. But they could not decide on that day. Remember I said that that they couldn't decide on a day for Christmas. Well, bless their hearts, they couldn't decide on the day, the actual day, that Jesus came out of the tomb. And so what happens is now, Easter is uh, uh, formulated by calculating the phases of the moon. That's how we get what day Easter falls on. It has to do with a particular Sunday, what a particular Sunday falls on, and whether it's a full moon on that Sunday. Because remember, Semiramis is the goddess of the moon. And so everything is is set on the phases of the moon and calculating those phases. And the result is, they say, that it can occur any time between March 22nd and April 25th. So if that's the case, you can have Easter any time in that area, and you're okay. Today, Jesus has been faded out with colored eggs, candy, and bunnies, and it's the wrong symbolism. 
Uh, there's clothing, there's toy products, there's candies. And I mean, these people make a mint during this time of year. Christmas, Easter, and Halloween, businesses will tell you that that's when their, their candy selling flourishes like no other time. They sell billions. Stores merchandise the name of Easter. As the body of Christ, we're instructed not to participate in witchcraft or pagan traditions and practices. Look what he says in 2 Corinthians 6, 17, 18. So, Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate. There's that word again. Touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you and will be your father, be a father unto you. And you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. And I think it's kind of important, though, that we do remember these things and we do keep them in our hearts because if there hadn't been a birth, there's no Savior. And without a Savior, there's no miracles, there's no knowledge of God or heaven, there's no meaning or purpose to any of our lives. I think we need to, celebrate, we need to, we, we need to keep in our hearts, I think we need to keep the memory of His death as we were instructed to do. Because without his death, there's no atonement for sins and there's no forgiveness. And if there's no resurrection, there's no eternal life, no fulfillment of promises of God, no power, and no Holy Spirit gifts. And most important, if it wasn't for those things, there'd be no second coming. So I think it's important that we keep those things, but not celebrate them and the way that the world celebrates it openly. And lastly, we want to look at Halloween. This is a time that I hate with a passion. Because for seven and a half years, as a high priest in Satanism, that was one of the days that was looked forward to. In Wicca, in the occult, in Satanism, every one of those, it's Samhain or Halloween is the day, the night that is celebrated the most. It is also a day when human sacrifice is celebrated. Now, kids look at it as a time of going from door to door trick-or-treating. And it's a time again of getting. Because the whole premise of Halloween is to go from door to door knock on the door, say trick-or-treat, and you get candy in your bag. Hopefully. Okay? I always wonder what would happen if you walked up and went, trick-or-treat, and they went, oh, trick. <laughs> <laughs> and shut the door on you. Then you probably, get toilet paper. probably. <laughs> but Halloween is a time when kids look the most to being something other than themselves. And it's also a time to dress up like ghouls and goblins, witches, your favorite superheroes. Um, some kids even dress up like Bible characters. Uh, and we, we put the jack-o'-lanterns out, the pumpkins out. We go get them out of the pumpkin patch. You know, we go on the hay rack rides where we can get the pumpkins and, and go carve faces into them. And it's a night of fear. And see, we celebrate fear because people like to be afraid. But is there another agenda behind Halloween? Is it all fun and games, or is it something else? Because see, there's a darker side to Halloween. Not just the dressing up in the costumes, not just the going door to door and asking for candy, or stealing other kids' candy. There's a hidden agenda behind it. There's a dark secret behind it. And what we have to do is we have to look behind the eyes of this celebration and we have to see what it's really all about. And again, if we can say that these things glorify Jesus, that these things bring edification to the body of Christ, that it's okay to celebrate. But the trick-or-treat to Halloween is not worth the price to pay. You see, when Lucifer was cast out of heaven because of his pride, because of his black heart, because he wanted to sit on the throne of God, he first thought, why shouldn't I be a God? 
And then he said, why shouldn't I be God? And the Bible says that he took with him one-third of the stars. Now, that's the angels. We don't know how many angels there were in heaven, so we don't know how many that is. But we do know that these beings became fallen. They were fallen from grace. And they're not allowed back into heaven. Satan has no, uh, uh, he has access to the throne of God. Even to today, he goes before God and accuses us. That's why he's called Satan, the accuser of the brethren. He has access to the throne of God where he can go in and accuse us, but he doesn't have access to go back in and take over his angelic authority again. You see, after Ezekiel, when, when Lucifer fell, nowhere else in Scripture is he ever referred to as an angelic uh, cherub, as a special or anointed cherub as he was in Ezekiel. And so Lucifer, coming down to heaven, or coming down from heaven, coming down to the earth, said, I've got to find a way to get back at the Creator. Well, now creation can't destroy its Creator. But, he said, what I will do is I will destroy the creation, us. And so that's why you have things like addictions. Uh, uh, that's why you have suicides, young deaths, because this is a way that the fallen angels get the creation to be destroyed by destroying themselves. And he said, I will come down and I will find a way to make people worship me without knowing it. Because I can't just come out in the open and say, here I am, I'm the devil, worship me. But if he can disguise himself as other things and get that worship for himself, then he's achieved his plans. And he did it through a celebration called Halloween. It all goes back to the Celtic religion. It all goes back to Wales, uh, Scotland, Ireland, over in the, those regions. And the Celts were a peculiar people. They were very peculiar people because they worshiped many different gods and goddesses. And so we have to look at the origin by going back to the Celtic religion and their beliefs. And some of the beliefs were they believed in the power of magic and they worshiped many different gods and they believed in the spirits of the dead returning. And they were a fierce people who lived in fear of the reigning priests of that time called the Druids. Now you have to understand something. These people are so afraid of the Druids, because that's the religious priests, they are so afraid of them that they will give their lives if the Druids tell them to. That's how they, much they fear them. They are very ritualistic. They practice witchcraft. They practice seeing, looking into the future, spells, and they look to omens to tell them their future. And these priests were also known as the mighty men of oak, because they carried oak staffs, and they believed that these staffs contained magical powers that they could call on at will. And they practiced human sacrifice as homage to their gods in return for favors that year. That's the Yule. Remember we talked about Christmas time and how the Yule was whether or not the gods that, that, that had been, or the uh, sacrifices that had been made on Samhain had been accepted or not. And these sacrifices were made on their most celebrated day called Samhain. And Samhain is a night when spirits of the dead rose from their graves and walked the land. And they were so afraid of these things, walking around. And you know, when you, when you come back as a, as a dead person, you're kind of decayed and everything, so you don't look like you just went to the salon, you know. You, you come back, you're, you're, you're weird looking, you're, you're scary looking. And so in order to, to trick them, what they decided to do was to dress like them. Now, if spirits come back... Not only are there, they were your friends in the flesh, they'll still be your friends in the spirit. If they were your enemies in the flesh, they're still going to come back and try to get revenge. So they're also your enemies in the spirit. And to protect themselves from all these vengeful spirits, what they would do would be to don costumes and try to look like them in order to trick them by making them blend in. And that's where we get the custom of the Halloween costume. The Celts would dress up in order to trick these spirits into thinking that, oh, I'm one of you, don't harm me. And that's the, that's the premise of the Halloween costume. 
And they would dress up in grotesque costumes. I mean, they would try to look like these beings, like these demonic spirits. Now, the origin of trick-or-treat. Kids, I want you to listen to me very carefully. As I told you before, I don't sugarcoat anything. And I'm not going to sugarcoat this. Here's where trick-or-treat comes from. These priests, these Druid priests on Samhain, on the night of Samhain, would go across the countryside and they would demand a sacrifice be made. And they would ask for the youngest child of the household or of that manner to be placed in chains on a post outside the house. And they would pass over the land that night and if the sacrifice was young enough and innocent enough and acceptable, then they would carve grotesque face in a turnip, not a pumpkin, not a pumpkin, because see, over in Ireland, the, the turnips are still the most widely used vegetable, not the pumpkin. It didn't go to a pumpkin until it came to the United States. They would carve a grotesque face in this turnip and set it on the porch of that house. And that was to symbolize to these spirits that were roaming around that night that the sacrifice had been made. And if the sacrifice wasn't given, if, if the father of the house stood up against these Druid priests and said, I'm, I'm not giving you my youngest, I'm not giving you my daughter, I'm not giving you my son, then they would draw a pentagram in goat's blood, the five-pointed star. They would draw it on the, the porch, uh, front door of that home. And someone in that home would die that night. Now, I'm not saying that, that demons went in and killed them. I'm not saying that the, the Druids snuck back in and killed them. But remember, these people are so afraid of these people that most of them died out of fear, literally died out of fear. And this is where trick-or-treat comes from. It has nothing to do with door-to-door -door seeking candy. It has nothing to do with walking up to someone and say, trick-or-treat. It has to do with child sacrifice. You know, this is, a, this is a time when kids need to learn, children need to learn how to evangelize these things. My daughter, who's eight, eight years old, can go to a school and she can tell any classmate in that, in that school why Halloween shouldn't be celebrated. She's no. She knows it. She's very sensitive in the spirit. She's also heard Daddy talk about it and she remembered everything. And she will evangelize. I've heard her talk to other kids about it. But peer pressure is a tough thing. And it's hard. It's hard to tell your child, well, you know, I don't want you dressing up like them. I don't want you wearing what they're wearing. I don't want you going out that night. Because, see, the, the kids will make fun of them for not doing it. Okay? So, as children, they need to learn how to evangelize the truth. Because, see, people don't want to hear the truth. In, all my, in the time that I started my, my, uh, my ministering and and. and God put me on the path to minister and, and expose these things, I found that the one truth was that people don't want to hear the truth. It's, they'd rather not know because then they're not accountable. You see, once you've heard the truth, now you're accountable for that truth and what you do with it. Now, what you're seeing here, these are modern-day Druids, and they're standing at a place called Stonehenge. In England. Now they still do not know what Stonehenge is, what, what the purpose of the true purpose of it is. Uh, they think that it has something to do with uh, astronomy, uh, the stars and the planets, and also seasons and times, and they say it's a huge clock, but nobody really knows. However, they do know that sacrifices were made on those grounds by the Druids, and these are modern day Druids. And I'm sure the, the authorities don't look too good on uh, them doing any sacrifices. But here they are assembled, and you see they're in a circle. And what they do, these are the, the priests here holding those, those twigs. See that? Remember we talked about the mistletoe being given out to the, to the people, believing that it was a, a powerful um, tool to, to do away with evil spirits. And what they do is they, they assemble there on Halloween night, and they believe that energies come down from the universe, travel into those stones, and are reflected. And in the center of that is a huge energy that they can tap. Whoa, wait a minute. 
Didn't we see that on that UN flag? The exact same thing with the people associated in a symbol, uh, in, a, in a circle, assembled, and then inside of that was the energy source. Hmm. And every year from September through November 1st, this tradition of the offering of sacrifices still continues. And this is why you have child abductions and school shootings. Now I want to read to you something that came across to me today. And this is from Fox News, and it's, it says, Hunt underway in Chicago for a creepy clown who stalks children. And it says, parents on Chicago's south side are on the edge after reports of a man dressed as a clown has tried to lure several children into his van. The creepy clown, who has been spotted four times in the past week on the city's west and south uh, sides, wears a wig and full face paint and carries balloons when he approaches children. And uh, area schools are on the alert, and some have even sent letters home to parents telling them to warn their children about talking to strangers. Here is an Ohio man burning cross was just a Halloween decoration. In Canton, Ohio, a Canton man accused of burning a cross in front of his home says he was arrested in a misunderstanding over his Halloween decorations. And it says that he wanted to make his annual yard display more authentic and set fire to the T-shaped wooden stand that holds up his scarecrow so it would look more weathered. <laughs> now, these people are so apt at abducting a child that all it takes, parents, is for you to turn your head just one time. You can be in a mall, you can be on your front porch and, and leave your child on the front porch, go in to answer the phone or go in to get something, come back out, and your son or daughter is gone. They usually use black vans, they paint the windows so you can't see in, and they will roll up, and I mean, there's three to four people in these vans, and they can, they can abduct a child before you know what's happened. And it makes my blood cringe whenever I see uh, an amber alert on the TV during this time. It's, it's because I know that, remember, Mabon is the gathering of sacrifices. It's the time when sacrifices are gathered for Sam Hain. And that's why you have school shootings during this time, more than any other time. Is this a time of sacrifice? The, the kids at Columbine watched a video game called Doom, day in and day out where you are attacked by zombie creatures. And if they bite you, you begin to get this infection and you become one of them. And so you go around and you start shooting these creatures. In the next video that I'm planning to do, I'm gonna show a, a, a screen of a, of a video game called Kindergarten Killer, where you are a disgruntled uh, bus driver at a, at a school and you begin to take a gun and you go from room to room shooting school children. Video game. It's still a time of sacrifice. What is the hidden agenda of Halloween? This is it. To fascinate, lure, and captivate our children to desire to be something other than themselves. That's the agenda. And you see it works because you have people like Harry Potter and some of those things that, that lure kids to want to become witches, want to become wizards. Uh, uh, you want to have a, a special demon, little demon with you, a shape-shifting demon with you as in uh, the golden compass. It gives them a chance to be something they're not. They can be something totally different. And I'll tell you what, I've seen kids dress up and as soon as that costume goes on, they're right in character. It's almost like their personality changes. In the last three to four years, I've watched an interest and obsession with magic and all forms of occult be on the rise. And what stunned me was that it, it, the largest group had once been school children, but now was being outnumbered by adults. And I thought it was kind of ironic because when I was on the uh, tour on the Under the Spell of Harry Potter, uh, when I was on that tour, 
God managed to put me on a plane and never failed, there'd be one adult or two adults on that plane reading Harry Potter books. And, you know, I mean, it was, a, it was a great time to minister, but it just, it just stunned me because, you know, it, it dawned on me that it's not the kids because the kids don't have the money to go out and buy these almost $50 books. It's the, it's the parents. It's the adults that go out and get it for them. And the more they begin to read it to their children, the more they get into the story, now they've got to find the next book so that they can find out what happened. And now they get wrapped up in it. And even Christians find themselves amazed and fascinated by the occult. Even Christians. It's all part of the strategy. After all, we've been told by our, our prominent church leaders, I remember when Chuck Colson came out, and he said, we've got to embrace all religions, and he's not the only one that said that. And we've got to realize that witchcraft and Satanism are a religion. And they're a protected religion. That means if they want to open up a satanic uh, church right next door to you, legally there's nothing you can do about it because they're protected. On the outside, these practices appear to be fun and they're, they're somewhat innocent, but the Lord doesn't see it that way. And he speaks of, of those things that, he's, that he hates and he detests in Deuteronomy 18. And even the media has, has grasped onto this. Now, I, I wonder if some of you have seen some of these. Uh, these are programs that are on television now. Uh, one of them is called Ghost Hunters. And these are plumbers by day and ghost hunters by night. And what they do, it's, it's on the Sci-Fi Channel, and what they do is they, they go into places that are reported to be haunted and people see uh, apparitions in the house or they see things moving around or they've had uh, attacks go on. And so what these guys do is they go in and they, they do what's called uh, electronic voice uh, projection and, and you can't hear the, the spirit speak to you. In other words, a ghost can't speak to you where you can audibly hear him, but he can talk on a, on a tape recorder. And so what they do is they take this special tape recorder and they put it on a table in, in that house and supposedly the spirit speaks to them on this tape recorder. So when they play it back, they hear the voice of the, the spirit speaking. Uh, another one is paranormal state, and these are college students that have formed a paranormal uh, uh, investigation team, and what they do, they don't just go out looking for ghosts, they go out looking for demons. Uh, there was one uh, episode where there was an eight-year-old boy, and he was being attacked, I mean literally attacked, being thrown against a wall, being scratched, uh, being literally attacked physically by something in the house, and so they went into this house and they, they played the Ouija board, and they contacted the spirit, and the spirit attacked the boy, and you saw him fall off of a chair, and he, he grabbed his stomach, and they opened up his, his shirt, and there were four scratches across his stomach. Now, ghosts don't do that. That's not the spirit of Uncle Bob or Aunt Lucy, okay? That's a demonic spirit. That's a demonic attack. Uh, there's most haunted, haunted places, haunted America. Oh, yeah, there's even Montel featuring a woman called Sylvia Brown. And Sylvia, good old Sylvia, she's a psychic, you know. What she does is she talks to these people, and she sees, she sees dead people, okay? And they're all over the place. And they're all around you. And she talks to them, and they talk to her. And so, you know, you can find out where Uncle Bob kept the inheritance or hid, you know, your, your money, you know, type of thing. And, and so she tells them, well, this is, just, uh, this, is, this is just Uncle Bill, and he's mad because you moved the piano from uh, the, the family room to the playroom, and if you'll move the piano back, he says that he'll stop all this, this attacks and everything will be okay. And so they do it, and so the, then all of a sudden the spirit stuff stops, and now they're happy, and they're, they're, you know what they've done? They've just given that spirit license to be there. Instead of going in and casting it out, they told it it's welcome, and it will stay there. And the elements of this satanic ceremony called Halloween is fear. See, people like to be afraid. It's the thrill of the rush. That's why you get on a, a, a big roller coaster, and you're going down that roller coaster, and you do the most stupid thing, I think, is you stand up or you throw your hands up in the air while you're getting ready to go down. You know, it's the thrill of the rush. It's that rush of fear, that adrenaline rush. 
that we all search for. That's why your teenagers go to those slasher movies where they're killing teenagers by the droves and they're slicing them up and they're mutilating them. And it's, it's the kind of thing that if you can sit there with your girlfriend and, and not get scared, not, you know, not uh, cringe or jump, you know, but she's over there just literally going off, then you're the man. Okay? So it's an element of fear because, see, fear will grip you faster than any other, other emotion. And it will capture you. Some of the, uh, some of the, the aspects of Halloween uh, are ghosts, ghouls, witches, devils, haunted houses, monsters, and what the police call hell night. And any, any police officer or sheriff's officer, deputy, will tell you what hell night's all about. So let's look at some of these things. Let's first look at ghosts and ghouls. Because what they say is that ghosts are the disembodied apparitions and they are your, your dead aunt or uncle or father or mother's spirit that is now coming back and visiting you or visiting someone in the house. Or it's a spirit that uh, uh, doesn't want to go into the, the afterlife and so now they're trapped in this house and they, they just want to stay there. That's what a ghost is. What really is a ghost? Well, here's a question. If a ghost is an apparition, what they call ectoplasm, and you can't touch it, okay, you can't literally physically reach out and touch it, because you, you've seen, you know, when they have the apparition, somebody will try to touch something and, and there's nothing there, it's just air. If you can't touch it, how can they touch you? And you know that there's a scripture in the Bible in 1 Samuel that says that the dead know nothing? So if the dead know nothing, why are you trying to talk to them? Why are you trying to reach out and touch them anyway? You're forbidden to. Uh, another scripture in Hebrews 9.27 says, And it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this they keep coming back. Or they just roam around the earth. Or their spirit is trapped here. No. But after this, the judgment. There is no roaming around. There is no second chance. Ghosts are what we call familiar spirits. They are demonic spirits that have been around you 24-7 or around the person that you're trying to contact through a Ouija board or going through a seance 24-7. And they know everything about you and about anyone else. And they will communicate back and forth to each other. And that's how they know so much. And that's how they can answer all your questions. And now you think it's that person that you're really trying to contact because nobody else would know what that spirit was telling you unless it was really them. Well, trick or treat. Ghouls. These are beings that are half dead, half alive. We call them zombies. Okay? Okay. Or people that just had a bad day at the doctor's office. And, and these things are grotesque and they, they, they feed on human flesh. And again, these are the kind of movies that our, our young people go to. They, they get that thrill of watching these things. Seeing other, other people being slaughtered, mutilated. Witchcraft. We look at uh, witchcraft and sometimes parents tell their kids, Oh honey, that's just something on TV. That's just something out of the Wizard of Oz. You don't really have to worry about that. Uh, or there's a, a good witch and a bad witch. You always notice that in the stories there's a good witch, but then there's a bad witch. Well, the Bible says the only good witch is a dead witch. So, <laughs> you know, you have to start, start giving your children the answers that they deserve to have, which is the truth. And witches actually cast spells, and they are primarily, traditionally, and exclusively of the female gender. Very rarely is a male ever allowed into a coven. And these witches will meet and they will do what is necessary to promote themselves. Whether it's uh, going out and, and a casting a spell on another girl or going out and casting a spell on an ex-boyfriend that dropped you, those sort of things. Young women by the hundreds flock into bookstores around the world. And they're seeking to tap into that secret magical power that will bring them their heart's desire at their command. And there was a book out uh, years ago called Teen Witch, written by a witch named Raven Wolf. And in, in Teen Witch, it appeal, appealed to teenage girls. 
to want to get into witchcraft, want to study witchcraft. Because see, it could tell you how to get your, if a woman had a, a, a boyfriend that you wanted, it told how to put a spell on him to make him leave her and go to you. It also told you uh, how to get the, the A's on the, on the school test, how to rule the, uh, the, the mind of the teachers so that they would give you good grades, so that they would pass you even though you were failing. Uh, all kinds of things like that. And that, see, that appeals to teenagers because they want things and they want it now. They don't want to wait. And so Teen Witch was one of the best-selling books on the market at that time. Make no mistake about it, witches are very real. They practice and they use for what's called forbidden magic or occult. And they use potions and they use charms and they use spell casting. Devils. Devils are fallen angels. They're now no longer angelic status. When they fell from heaven, they lost their angelic authority. They're still able to operate in the spiritual realm, but they can also operate in the physical realm. And they're referred to as devils. Nothing more than fallen angels. Haunted houses. You know, we glorify these things. Uh, sometimes a city puts on a, a haunted house. Um, uh, some good organizations, well-meaning organizations, uh, will sponsor what's called a haunted house. And these things bring big bucks in. Millions throughout the, throughout the year, throughout this, this time of the year. Because people want to get scared. They want to be afraid. And so what they will do will be to go into these houses and there'll be actors or, or uh, people that have been uh, uh, given instructions on how to become a monster and they will dress up like uh, these characters and, and these ghouls and these goblins and these devils and these witches and they will go into these houses and when you're walking through a room, they'll jump out at you. Or they'll, they'll pop up and they'll try to grab onto you. And it's all, it's all the element of fear. Because not only will you go through the house, you'll also turn around and you'll go back through it again. Because once you've seen it now, now you know what to expect, so now you go through it. And what makes a house haunted? Well, it's, first of all, it's, they say it's inhabited by spirits of the dead. In other words, somebody doesn't want to leave the place. In some cases, violent demonic attacks occur. Well, what brings them? What makes a house haunted? Well, several things. An evil deed, a murder, abuse, any kind of abuse. It doesn't have to be physical abuse. It can be verbal abuse. That's why, uh, brothers and sisters, as Christians, we've got to be careful the words we speak in our homes because we can bring forth curses or blessings. Torture, and because they've been summoned to be there. In other words, somebody opened up a book and called forth a demonic spirit just, you know, experimenting. Or they played a Ouija board and they contacted the spirit. Or they played uh, uh, tar with tarot cards or they played with crystal balls. Those things will attract demons like a magnet. All those things will. This is a house on South 93rd Street. And it got its notoriety by, uh, this, was, this was years ago, Got some notoriety with a uh, Shawnee County Sheriff's deputy who went out there because there were kids out there. It was an abandoned house. And they were going out there and because kids were going in and they were having beer parties out there. And they went into the house and the deputy went up into the master bedroom and he said that on the bedroom floor, on the, the, the upstairs floor, was painted a circle. And inside that circle was a five-pointed intersecting star. And inside that star was a, in the center of the star was a dead squirrel. And it was stinking. And so he said, I, I walked in, I, I walked into the circle and I picked the squirrel up and I took it out and threw it away. And after that, he had wrecked, I, I, I'm thinking it's like three to four police cars, uh, sheriff's cars. He wrecked them. He fell off of a, a ladder, the ladder of, uh, Scaffolding just gave way and he fell off, broken arm. His, his wife went through a, a bunch of ailments and some of his kids did also. And he attributes what happened to him because he walked into that circle and got that squirrel out. Then it got notoriety because kids now thought it was kind of cool to go out there 
And so they did, and they started walking in there, and they would hear voices speak to them with no one there. Uh, some kids reported going into rooms, and their names would appear uh, like something was carving their name on the wall or on a door. And then there were people who went out and took pictures of the house, and not on the regular photo itself, but on the negative, uh, you could see flames coming out the window of the house. And the house got kind of torn down, run down, uh, it was kind of fallen down, and uh, the, the good brother that brought me to the Lord, um, he called me and he said, let's go out there. And I said, okay. And so we did, and we walked in the back, and outside in the backyard, it was, it was interesting because covering the whole backyard were these huge stones, and they formed a huge circle in the backyard. And we went inside the house and we, we found the pentagram and, and, I, and I saw that it was a satanic pentagram, the five-pointed star turned upside down. And around that star were written the Enochian keys, which only uh, Satanists would know what those symbols meant. And then we went downstairs and we found the fireplace and the fireplace had been uh, uh, chipped out so that it would form an altar so that it would be the, uh, big enough for a person to be laid on. And we went downstairs and we found bones. We didn't ask what kind of bones. Um, since then, that house uh, had a fence put around it because too many people were going out there. Uh, it was private property. The, the people who owned the, the land were complaining. They put up a fence, and then uh, they, the, finally the, they tore the house down. And uh, as I understand it from, from my good brother, Reg, uh, they've built a beautiful home out there now. But guess what? The land was never cleared. What was there before is there now. And it's only a matter of time before evil rears its ugly head and stuff starts happening in that home because they never, they never repented and never cleared the land. This is Anton Zandor LeVay, the head of the Church of Satan. Look what it says. We think two different. There are those who actually worship Satan and will make a pact, a blood pact with him for fame and fortune or whatever their heart's desire is for a certain amount of time on the earth and then Satan calls on that contract. We have the wannabes and you have the elite. The wannabes are the kids that, uh, that dress up in the face paint like the white paint, uh, put the black lipstick on, the black around their eyes, paint their fingernails black, and they're fascinated with death. They're called goths. And the elite are your doctors, your lawyers, your professionals that are high up, even government officials that are high up there that are in the position they're in because they've, they've signed a blood pact. Hell Knight, ask yourself this, why do all the idiots come out on, on Halloween? Literally, I mean, laced candy. When we started hearing about laced candy, people putting uh, a PCP in candy, injecting it into, into candy. Now, who would do that to a child? It's, 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 it's like if your mind is not all there or you have some kind of mental disability, you can be affected by these things more than anybody else. There's vandalism. Police will tell you that there's more vandalism on that night than any other night. I don't know how many mailboxes we've had destroyed by kids going down the, the, the street on that night and they'll take baseball bats and hit the mailboxes and break them off. Um, I got smart. I put a big metal post in there so that if they hit with a baseball bat, they're going to boom. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a night of vandalism. It's arson uh, where they set fires to buildings. And there's also deaths. Remember years ago, uh, there was uh, on the college campuses, people were building huge bonfires and... and uh, in, in celebration or being in effigy and they, they were making these things as high as they would go and then people were falling off of scaffolds or off of uh, platforms and falling into the fire and, and dying. Hell night. People participate in strange games and customs of this pagan religion. Some of the things that they participate in is bonfires. These were bonfires built to light the way for the spirits and they were also used in druid sacrifices of humans. Uh, what they would do would be to put the, the sacrifice in a wicker basket and they would hang it over a, a huge bonfire and the way that the sacrifice burned is w told them whether or not they were going to have a good year. 
the guy in the basket wasn't having a good time, but it told the Druids whether or not they were going to have a good year. Snap Apple, uh, this is a game, we call it Bobbing for Apples, and it was a means of divination, and it was played by boys, young boys, and apples were set afloat in a tub of water, and if you could uh, take your hands behind your back, and you could reach down into that water and pull up an apple, that you were assured of the love of your desire. And that's where the, the bobbing for apples comes from. Divinations, they have runes, casting stones, and scrying, and that's like taking a mirror and painting it black, and if you stand there and look long enough into the mirror, you're supposed to be able to see things. Well, I'm sure if you looked into a black mirror long enough, you start seeing anything, you know. But. And it was divining of the future, and they would ask it questions concerning uh, marriage, luck, health, and one times of, uh, when one's time of death was going to be. Those were popular uh, questions then. Owls, bats, cats, and toads are things you see all over in Halloween. They're, they're, they're creatures that are familiar with Halloween. And they're considered to be what's called witches' familiars. And it's believed that Satan would take the form of one of these animals and aid the witch in divining the future. Jack-o'-lanterns, these are the pumpkins. Remember we, we talked about it started out as turnips. And then when it was Americanized, it was pulled over to pumpkins. And they started carving grotesque faces in pumpkins. Also called lantern man, hobblelangers, or will o' wisp. And there were ghostly lights that bobbed along like a lantern in someone's hand or, uh, called corpse candles over in England. And uh, they, were, they would appear in, in bogs and things, and people would see these lights and think that they were spirits. And the Celts would carve grotesque faces in turnips to fool evil spirits. Today, not much has changed. We're still doing exactly the same practices. Sam Hain, the Lord of the Dead, the Night of the Dead, is glorified and promoted in the movie industry. There was a movie out uh, in 2007 called Halloween, a remake by Rob Zombie. And it was a remake of a, a series of movies called Halloween. And it featured a maniacal killer called Michael Myers. And Michael Myers killed his sister with a big butcher knife. And then all of a sudden, something possessed him. And he was put into an institution. And he grew up in an institution, an asylum. And he was worked with with a doctor. And the doctor said that when he looked into the eyes of Michael, all he saw was pure evil. That he knew that evil existed because it was living in Michael Myers. And now Michael Myers escapes from the, the asylum. And he goes about and he dons a... <laughs> Believe it or not, he dons a, a made-up uh, William Shatner mask. You know, the captain, yeah, from, from Star Trek. And uh, they, he dons one of those masks, but it's made painted white and made to look totally different. And he, he dons this mask, and he dons a pair of overalls, and now he goes about killing teenagers. And when you watch the movies, it's nothing more than a, a time of mutilation and murder. I mean, and, it, and it's graphic, very graphic. And you see the, that, that rush, that adrenaline rush, is what draws teenagers to watch these movies. And the, the weird thing about him is you can't kill him. You can blow him up, you can cut him up, you know, but you can't kill him. He, he keeps coming back. There's Halloween 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you know. You just can't, you can't get rid of him. can't get rid of Michael Myers. The enemy is real. Then we have to learn the hidden things about him. We have to learn how to discern what is evil and what is not. Now, listen to me. We cannot become Christian witch hunters. There is not a demon under every rock or a devil around every corner. But when something is out and out open and they're blatant about it, then it is our responsibility to expose that darkness. But we can't be Christian witch hunters and go looking for the devil and everything. Because see, the trouble is, if you look for the devil and everything, you're going to find him and everything. The enemy is real. It's not something made up. It's not something out of the Wizard of Oz. It's not something in a book. He's real. He exists. And his plot and his plan and his whole agenda is to get rid of God's creation. There are those who worship the devil in the dark side, and they're very dangerous. The Gothic we talked about, the Gothic movement came about several years ago. 
and it gave people an opportunity to celebrate death, people that were fascinated with the macabre. Halloween gives people the opportunity to become a part of this strange, weird, and horror-filled world of darkness. Even adults look forward to the night that they can dress up in costume and become somebody or something else. Remember, the whole agenda is to fascinate and lure and captivate into being something other than yourself. And as a child, we're taught that it's fun to scare others. Oh, it was great. I mean, I used to look forward to Halloween so bad as a teenager. Because, see, I, I'd lay down by the, by the porch on our house, and I'd lay there and wait for kids to come up to the porch. And I had the light kind of dim on the, on the porch. I put in like one of those 10-watt bulbs or whatever, you know, so that they couldn't really see really good. And I had a glove filled with Kleenex, and it was hanging out of the mailbox. And I had a, a you know, I had on the, on the middle finger, I had a, a string going up, and I could move that string and make that hand wave, you know, like this. And, and it was so much fun, you know. I mean, the, the kids would come up to the door, and they'd ring the doorbell, ding-dong, and I'd go, oh. And you'd leave these little kids and look at each other and go, what was that? And I said, I, had, I don't know. Like that, ring it again. Ding dong. And I go, what do you want? You know, like that. And you can just see the fear. They start trembling, you know. And I'd be like, hee, hee, hee. You know. And, and I'd start working that hand. You know, look at that hand. Look at that hand. <laughs> you know, going up and down. And, and, and they were just scared, you know. And it was, oh, it was fun. You know, and they'd, and they'd drop their candy and run off and we'd pick it up. You know, it was great. But it gives, it gives us a time to, to really scare other people. And it's fun to scare other people, see? What they're actually doing is they're opening themselves up to secret things that are biblically forbidden and should remain sealed. Should never have been opened. But most parents don't see any harm with allowing their kids to dress up and copy these things. They even see it as innocent fun. Blessed Sam Hain, what you're seeing here is a witch in her cauldron. See the Ouija board, the Wiccan star. They celebrate this night. This is one of their holidays. If Satan had a holiday, this would be it. Why would any child who professes to love Jesus want to dress and look like something that God says he hates? He calls it an abomination. Deuteronomy 18 says that God finds these practices to be an abomination. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. Abomination is something that God detests with his whole heart. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. That's child sacrifice. Do we still have that? Absolutely. One way we have it is abortion. Or that useth divination. These are tools used for foretelling and seeing into the future crystal balls, tarot cards, or an observer of times. This is stargazing, astrology, divination, uh, supposed influence of the stars and how they work on your, your uh, life. You know, what sign are you? Or an enchanter, one who hypnotizes and controls through his voice or by music. A lot of bands out there know how to hypnotize kids with the music. Or a witch, one who practices the ancient craft and uses magic spells, potions, and hexes to promote herself. Or a charmer, one that uses objects like jewelry, etc., to cast spells over others and control their minds. Or the Bible says a consulter with familiar spirits, one who has spirit guides, giving them counsel and advice on their affairs and undertakings. Or a wizard like Harry Potter, skilled in the magical arts, one who's able to summon and cast spells. Or a necromancer, one who attempts to summon the dead in order to get information. Remember we said the dead know nothing? Seances, Ouija boards, mirrors, grave calling. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. These are instructions for blessings but it's also a warning goes with it. And that is, we've got to be careful whose door we're knocking on. Because if you're knocking on the door of Satan, 99 to 100% chance, he's going to be home. And he'll answer. He's ready to answer that door. He's ready to answer on a beck and call. 
In the book of Proverbs, we find the, the lifelong fruits of training a child <clears throat> in the way he or she should go. We're able to make this training so strong and deep that our children grow older, they won't depart from it. Train up a child, Proverbs 22, 8 says, in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. If that same child is trained in the ways of the world and Satan, chances are they won't depart from that either. Former Beatles member George Harrison understood this. He uh, was a Hindu, uh, and he worshipped a Hindu god called Krishna. And in a Rolling Stones interview, he said this, The main thing is to get the kids, nail you when you're young, and brainwash you. Then, you've got, then they've got you for the rest of your life. And that's true. The lure of the occult is strong. Strong. We cannot get caught up in it. We've got to be very careful that we don't get so fascinated that we're drawn in before we know what happened. The church has got to stop condoning and accepting these beliefs and practices and use the authority it's been given to fight against these things. I've said it before. The church is the only institution on the face of the earth that has the authority to go against the very gates of hell itself. But we're not doing it. We've lost our spiritual muscle. We've lost that authority. We've got to get it back. We've got to realize we're in a war. We're in a mission field, but we're also on a battlefield each and every day of our lives. We've got to put on God's holy armor. We've got to put on the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, and take up the sword of the Spirit. And you say, well, what about the shoes? Well, see, that's up to you. Because once you know the truth, it's your responsibility to take it out. Not keep it in the church, not keep it in Sunday school class, not keep it to yourself, but take it out. Because there's too many out there that are perishing. We've got to take it forth. We've got to take what we know and take it forth. While, while it's still time. Those who love and love the, serve the Lord Jesus Christ have no business flirting with the kingdom of darkness. None at all. The fight's on. When thou goest to do battle, look what, what God says. When thou goest to do battle against thine enemies and seest horses and chariots and people more than thou, be not afraid of them. For the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. That's to let you know that greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. The lines have been drawn, the war's been declared, and it's on. We've got to be like lions. We can't be like meat kittens anymore. We've got to start roaring the truth. We've got to start making people listen. Jesus is watching over the world to see if we will follow his instructions. Look what he says. Therefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate. Touch not the unclean thing. And if we do all these things, and if we keep in account what God says and his word and not stray from some other belief system or let some other system come in and corrupt us. If we can do those things, we can have victory over the darkness.